Good morning. I am pleased to welcome you to the California Privacy Protection Agency's May 26, 2022 public meeting. My name is Jennifer Urban. I am the chairperson of the board for the agency. Before we get started with the substance of the meeting, as usual, I have some logistical announcements. First, I'd like everyone here in person to please check that your microphone, excuse me, I'd like everyone to check that your microphone is muted when you're not speaking. And for everyone here who is in person to please silence your cell phones. Thank you um, for everyone, to everyone for doing that. And also I'd like to announce that this meeting is being recorded. Today's meeting will be run according to the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act as required by law. I'm very pleased to be here in person with the members of the board and some members of the public and to welcome many of you online via Zoom. I do have two related observations and requests. First, this is our very first hybrid in-person and remote meeting, so please bear with us as we work out any kinks. Second, the rapid increase in COVID-19 cases in California generally, and specifically in Alameda County, where our physical meeting is located, has created some substantial logistical challenges, again, on which I hope you will bear with us. We have encouraged the public to join the meeting remotely and are also encouraging everyone to wear masks if you're attending in person. We are not requiring these things. I thought it would be helpful, however, to say a little bit about why we are encouraging them, even though we've been excited about moving to the in-person meetings. First, the current variant of COVID-19 is spreading extremely rapidly due to a very high level of contagiousness. And of course, we want to avoid exposing vulnerable members of the community or inadvertently making our public meetings less accessible to them. Second, our tem temporary ability to meet remotely and still comply with Bagley Keene has expired and has not been renewed. This means, unfortunately, that the current rapid spread of the virus could pose some serious logistical issues to the board's work on behalf of the public. This is because we no longer have the option under Bagley Keene of holding entirely remote meetings or for any board member to participate remotely, even if they test positive. This means that if a board member is COVID-19 positive, that person simply cannot participate in a public meeting. In addition, our board meetings must be publicly noticed 10 days in advance with all physical and remote locations on the notice. Accordingly, we cannot easily reschedule a meeting if board members um, test positive or become ill. So I greatly appreciate everyone bearing with us. Thank you. All right, now I'll go over meeting logistics and participation. We will proceed through the agenda, which is available as a handout here in Oakland and also on the CPPA website. Materials for the meeting are also available as handouts here and on the CPPA website. You may notice board members accessing their laptops or other devices during the meeting. They are using these devices solely to access materials for the board meeting. After each agenda item, there will be an opportunity for questions and discussion by the board members. Then there will be an opportunity for public comment. I will ask for public comment on each agenda item. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes per agenda item. We also have a designated time on the agenda for general public comment. I think it's agenda item eight today. We have members of the public attending online via Zoom and also in person here in Oakland. So I have slightly more complicated logistics than usual. When it is time for the first opportunity for public comment, I will first call for comment from Zoom attendees, then from in-person attendees. At the next opportunity for public comment, I will reverse, starting with in-person attendees and then move to Zoom attendees. And I will, um, I will alternate in that manner through the meeting. If you're attending via Zoom and wish to speak on an item, please use the raise your hand function, which is in the reaction feature on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Our moderator will request that you unmute yourself for comment. When your comment is completed, the moderator will mute you, excuse me. <clears throat> please note that the board will not be able to see you, only hear your voice. Thus, it is helpful if you identify yourself by your name and your affiliation if you have one. But this is entirely voluntary, and you can also input a pseudonym when you log into the Zoom meeting. If you're attending in person and wish to speak on an item, please wait for me to call for public comment, then move toward the podium um, at the front of the room um, and form a line 
uh, keeping social distancing in place. Please move to the podium when you're called to speak. As with the Zoom attendees, it is helpful if you identify yourself when you begin speaking. But again, this is entirely voluntary and you are free to refer to yourself with a pseudonym or to not give a name. I'd like to remind all speakers to stay on topic and to keep your comments to three minutes or less so everyone has an opportunity to speak. Relatedly, I would like to remind everyone of the rules of the road under Bagley Keene. Both board members and members of the public may only discuss items that are on the agenda for today when those items are up for discussion. The public can bring up additional topics when the board takes up the agenda item for that purpose. As I mentioned, it's number eight today. However, board members can't respond. We can only listen. In addition, items not on the agenda can be suggested for discussion at future meetings when the board takes up the agenda item designated for that purpose. That is number nine on today's agenda. The board welcomes public comment on any item on the agenda, and it is the board's intent to ask for public comment prior to the board voting on any agenda item. If for some reason I forget to ask for public comment on an agenda item, and you wish to speak on that item, please let us know. Yes. Yeah, if we could just pause for just a minute. Of course. Um, Sorry. We're going to pause for technical work. Okay. Okay. Sorry, move forward. How far back should I go? About a minute. Um, All right, thanks for everyone for bearing with us. Um, so should I start with um, how to participate in public comments? Yes. Okay, sure. Um, I'll start with, um, we're going through the agenda, which is available online, and also here's a handout in Oakland. After each agenda item, there will be an opportunity for questions and discussion by the board members. So you'll see us do that. Um, there will also be an opportunity for public comment on each agenda item. Each speaker will be limited to, to three minutes per agenda item. In addition, we do have an agenda item, number eight today, for general public comment, which I'll say a little bit more about in a second. We have members of the public attending online via Zoom and also here in person in Oakland. Um, so I have a little bit more on logistics for participation um, in, that, in this situation. When it is time for the first opportunity for public comment, I will first call for comment from Zoom attendees. Um, when that happens, the moderator will, um, uh, please raise your hand and the moderator will recognize you. Um, after the Zoom attendees have given public comment, I will um, call on in-person attendees whom we will ask to move forward to the front of the room where there is a podium. At the next opportunity for public comment, I will reverse, starting with in-person attendees and moving to Zoom and so forth through the meeting. Um, uh, if uh, you at any time do not um, uh, do think that you've missed a chance to comment because I forgot to ask, um, please just let us know. Please do note that the board will not be able to see you if you are attending via Zoom. We will only be able to hear your voice. Um, given that, it is helpful if you identify yourself um, verbally, but this is voluntary, and you can also put in a pseudonym when you log into the Zoom meeting. If you're attending in person, um, it is also helpful um, if you identify yourself when you begin speaking. But again, this is voluntary, and you're welcome to refer to yourself with a pseudonym or not give a name. I'd like to remind everybody to stay on topic and to keep your comments to three minutes or less so everyone has the opportunity to speak. Relatedly, I'd like to remind everyone of the rules of the road under Bagley Keene. Both board members and members of the public 
may only discuss items on the agenda for today when those items are up for discussion. The public can bring up additional topics when the board takes up the agenda item for that purpose. As I mentioned, today it is number eight. Um, however, the board won't be able to respond. We can only listen. In addition, items that are not on the agenda for today's discussion can be brought up by board members or the public um, for potential discussion at future meetings when the board takes up the agenda item for the purpose of discussing future agenda items. That is number nine on today's agenda. The board welcomes public comment on any item on the agenda, and it is the board's intent to ask for public comment prior to us voting on any agenda item. If for some reason I forget to ask for public comment on an agenda item and you wish to speak, please let us know. If you're participating by Zoom, please use the raise your hand function so our moderator can recognize you. If you are in person, please raise your hand and let me know I forgot. You will be called to the podium to provide your comment. Please note that our first item today is a closed session item, so I will be establishing a quorum and then the board will go into closed session. To effi most efficiently use everyone's time, excuse me, <coughs> and to avoid members of the public who are attending in person to have to leave the room and come back too often to check if we're back, the board will finish the closed session item and then break for lunch, after which the board will return to this public session. I will not resume the public portion of the meeting before 1 p.m. I cannot predict perfectly how long the closed session discussion will go, so I hope this will give everyone a little bit of certainty and the ability to go take a walk, get something to eat, etc. It is possible that the board's closed session business will take a little bit longer, um, and in which case we will return as soon after 1 p.m. as possible, but either way, we will not resume the meeting, the public portion, before 1 o'clock. I will repeat necessary introductory information um, for anyone who is waiting to join until we take up the public session agenda items. My thanks to the board members for their service and to all the people working to make this meeting possible. I would like to thank the team from the Office of the Attorney General supporting us today, Mr. Malad Belju, who is acting as our meeting counsel, Ms. Trini Hurtado, who is acting as moderator and is the conference services expert who's organized this meeting infrastructure, I would like to thank um, Brian Souglé, our acting general counsel, for his presentation today and his work behind the scenes, and Ms. Von Chidambira, our deputy director of administration, and her team of CPP staff for their work behind the scenes. I'd also like to express my gratitude for the team of the Department of Consumer Affairs for managing our communications list and website, where I'm sure many of you got some information about this meeting. I would also like to thank um, the uh, Office of the Attorney General more generally for all the support they've provided for us, the Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency, the Department of Consumer Affairs, and the Department of General Services um, for all of the work that goes into making these meetings possible. I now call the meeting to order and ask our moderator, Ms. Hurtado, to please conduct the roll call. Uh, yes. Uh Ms. Delatori? Present. Mr. Lay? Present. Ms. Sierra? Present. Mr. Thompson? Present. Ms. Urban? Present. All are present and accounted for. You have established a quorum. Thank you very much, Ms. Hurtado. Um, we have established a quorum. I would like the board members to know that we will be taking a roll call vote on any action items today. Next, the board will go into closed session for discussion of the executive director's appointment of a deputy director of public affairs under the authority of government code 11126, subdivision A, subdivision, sub, subdivision one. Before the board departs for the closed session discussion, is there any public comment from those participating via Zoom? Does the first commenter is Peg Schreiner. Peg Schreiner, you have three minutes to make your comment, beginning now. Okay, Ms. Schreiner uh, disconnected. The next commenter is Mr. Bruin, Paul Bruin. Mr. Bruin, you need to unmute your mic on your side. Okay, um, Mr. Bruin, if you can uh, hear this, we do need you to unmute your mic. We look forward to your comment.
All right. Um, uh, I will now ask if there is any public comment from anyone participating here in person. And we'll circle back um, and see if Mr. Bruin is able to make his comment um, after that. All right, seeing no one here in person, have we had any luck with Mr. Bruin? No. Okay. Um, Mr. Bruin, if you can hear us, um, please do feel free to raise your hand when we next have opportunity for public comment um, uh, so, that we, so that we can hear from you. Um, and I do apologize um, if there is a technical issue that is um, causing challenges for you. Um, with that, the board will go into closed session. We will return to this public session when we are finished. And again, we won't start before 1 p.m. to give everyone some certainty. For folks who are here in person, as long as you return by 1 p.m., you won't miss anything. Thank you all for attending our meeting today. I'd like to inform everyone that the board did not take any votes or actions during the closed session. Um, we did have um, one person, at least, who wanted to make a public comment before we went into closed session, and we were unable to contact him. So I'd like to ask again if Mr. Bruin is um, on the Zoom and would like to make a public comment, we'd like to give him another chance, as well as anybody who had any technical difficulties. So we'll wait for just a moment. And as a reminder, in order to comment via Zoom, please use the raise hand function. The moderator will um, contact you and then you can unmute yourself. Ms. Hurtado, do we have anyone waiting to speak? Not at this time. Okay, thank you. Okay, again, welcome back everyone. Uh, we will now move to agenda item number three on our agenda, which is an update from our executive director, Mr. Ashkan Sultani. Um, uh, Mr. Sultani, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Chairperson Urban. Great, thank you, Chairperson Urban. And thank you to the board for the opportunity to provide an update today. Before I start, I want to echo Chairperson Urban's opening remarks and thank the team from both our agency and the Office of the Attorney General for supporting us today. Also, I want to thank the folks at the Department of Consumer Affairs and the NBCSH for all the support they provide us. This is our first in-person meeting, and as a fledgling agency, there's a lot to coordinate to meet both our in-person obligations under the Bagley Keene Act and the desire to provide access to the widest range of stakeholders possible via teleconference. Thank you all. Today I'm going to present an update on three main topics, hiring, budget, and rulemaking. Starting with the hiring, I'm incredibly proud at the progress we've made as, as we're hiring. We're essentially hiring as quickly as the state process allows. In addition to the previous hires announced during my last update, I'm pleased to announce that we've hired Maureen Mahoney as our director, Deputy Director of Policy and Legislation. Maureen comes to us from Consumer Reports and brings a wealth of experience on consumer privacy issues. Welcome, Maureen. We've also brought on key HR staff that have greatly increased our ability to post and hire through the government recruiting process. We're also in the process of bringing on a significant number of staff to further build out the legal division and I'll be making those hires in the coming weeks. Finally, we're also recruiting for a number of positions, including legal analysts, law clerks, technologists, sorry, technologists, student assistants, and key admin staff. Those postings will be either on our website or Twitter, uh, and additional ones will be posted in the coming weeks. Finally, we're in the process of reposting for our public affairs deputy to clarify that we're seeking candidates that not, hold, not only have the communications expertise, but also have the education, the public education and outreach ed expertise to lead our public awareness effort. As the board is aware, in addition to implementing and enforcing our statute, promoting public awareness and education on the risks, responsibilities, safeguards, and rights in relations to the collection, use, sale, and disclosure of personal information is one of our key functions. Now I'd like to move to talk about our budget process. I had the honor of presenting our proposed budget to the Senate and Assembly Budget Sub-4 uh, Committees last March. 
As I previously men mentioned, our agency's $10 million appropriations is provided for in our statute. However, we are still required to create and present a budget change proposal to outline our expenditure. As I highlighted in, our boards, in the board's February meeting, the 2022-2023 budget change proposal requests the creation of 34 positions to enable us to satisfy our initial statutory obligations with an initial focus on rulemaking and public awareness. Importantly, the BCP does not reflect our full complement of staff, and most notably, it does not include staffing of our enforcement division, as that function only begins in July 2023. The BCP is still pending approval, but remains unchanged in the May budget revision. The governor's budget must be passed by the legislature by June 15th and will take effect July 1st of this year. Now on to our rulemaking. We've made significant process, sorry, we've made significant progress in our rulemaking process as well. And I understand the process subcommittee plans to discuss this topic further. As the board is also aware, in addition to the substantive pre-rulemaking comments we received last year, we held a set of instructive, instructive informational sessions in late March to inform the board, staff, and public on topics relevant to the upcoming rulemaking. The materials for those hearings, sorry, the materials for those sessions, including recordings and transcripts of the information set, is available on our meetings and events page on our website. We also held a set of stakeholder sessions earlier this month to provide the opportunity for stakeholders to speak on topics relevant to the upcoming rulemaking. These three-day sessions were held via video conference to assist in accommodating the widest range of possible stakeholders. We had quite a broad turnout, and as with the informational sessions, recordings of the stakeholder sessions are available on our website. Transcripts and other materials will be made available as soon as they're processed. During my last update, I highlighted that one of my first acts as executive director after coming on in October was to provide formal notice to the California Attorney General that our agency is prepared to assume rulemaking activities under the CCPA. On April 21st of this year, the rulemaking authority under the CCPA formally transferred to our agency. We recently marked another key milestone earlier this month on May 5th, 2022, when the California Office of Administrative Law pursuant to Section 100 of the regulations approved the transfer of the existing CCPA regulations to Title 11, Division 6, a new division of the California Code of Regulations that is under the jurisdiction of our agency. While these amendments are non-substantive and merely renumber the existing CCPA regulations, they represent the beginning of our rulemaking role. The rulemaking materials, including a chart highlighting the renumbered sections is available on our website on the regulations page. <clears throat> Finally, with regards to our initial substantive rulemaking package, over the last six months, staff has been working diligently with input from respective subcommittees to develop draft rules and supplemental materials to present to the board. The draft rules incorporate a significant amount of input provided by the public through the pre-rulemaking pre activities I laid out above and the draft package is now mostly complete. We look forward to the discussion by the process subcommittee on the proposed rulemaking timeline for how to move forward with these rules. In addition to finalizing our proposed rules, staff has been working on some other administrative components of the rulemaking, including preparation for holding formal hearings and working with the contracted economists on the economic impact assessments of the proposed regulations. While ministerial, these tasks need to be considered in light of the rulemaking timeline as well. And that is my update. Thank you, Chairperson Urban. I'm happy to take questions if there are any. Thank you very much, Mr. Zoltani, um, both for the clear update and for all of the work. It's I find it especially exciting that we have had our authority transferred to us to undertake rulemaking and that we now have our own section in the Code of Regulations, it makes everything feel a little bit more official. I'd also like to welcome Ms. Mahoney and um, thank her for helping out today. We're very excited to have her here. And with that, um, are there questions or comments for the board? And before we begin, I can only see down the table. 
So please like stick your hand out a little bit <laughs> so that I can see you and I will recognize you. Any comments or questions from the board? Yes, Ms. De La Torre. I have one question on the budget. Um, I understand that the budget is about to be approved for this um, year. Uh, and I want to stop here to thank the executive director and I know our acting general counsel for helping us get in through this budget process. You were hired shortly before the whole process started. Looking into the future for the next budget, what is going to be the process like and what is the involvement of the board in terms of understanding the budget ahead of time and just having a little bit more visibility perhaps? I think that's a great point. I do plan to, to in a future board meeting, go through some of the strategic priorities, including the budget, and receive input from the board on whether those priorities are in line with the expectation of the board. So thank you for flagging that. We, indeed, I was brought on in October, and I, which is when most agencies have their budget ready. Um, and I hope we get a head start on that this year. Once the budget is approved, we'll move forward. A particular interest will be the remaining complement of staff, as well as any other expenditures the, the board feels necessary, such as um, you know uh, the uh, uh, facilities we might engage in, holding events like these, our outreach efforts, et cetera. I, I have a connecting question. Mm -hmm. In terms of um, subcommittees, I know there is the startup and administrative subcommittee. Mm -hmm. Will that be the right subcommittee, may, maybe for um, the director to have some conversations over future bias or how? Is it thank you, thank you for the question, Ms. De La Torre. I think that maybe the thing to do would be for Ms. Sierra and I, as the startup and administration subcommittee, to check with council. Okay. And the reason why I say that is because the budget, what is it, budget control proposal? Forgive me. Change. Budget change proposals, those are confidential, at least until they get to some point. Is it now public? Because the It is not public since it's okay. been included. So I, we will need to figure out what are the sort of parameters. Mm -hmm. And then would it be OK, Ms. Sierra, if we do that and report back in another meeting? Yes, that okay. makes a lot of sense to me. Does well. that make sense to you, Ms. De La Torre? Yes, absolutely. OK, thank you. Um, other questions or comments for the executive director? Ms. Sierra? I just have a comment, and I just um, very much want to thank our executive director, um, Mr. Shaltani, and the whole team, you know, Brian Souble, our um, acting general counsel, and welcome, Maureen, that I'm really excited about the progress that's being made in hiring, and um, also wanted to underscore that with the stakeholder sessions, informational hearings, um, were really helpful. So thank you very much thank for you. all the work on that. Thank you. Oh, yes. Can I please second that? The info sessions and the stakeholder sessions were incredibly helpful. And I can only imagine how much work that was. So thank you. Other comments or questions? OK, thank you very much, um, Mr. Sultani, and to the board. I will now ask if there are if there's public comment. And this time, we'll start with members of the public attending in person. Is there anyone attending in person who would like to make a public comment? OK. Um, and uh, public comment from anyone attending via Zoom. Is there anyone who would like to comment, Ms. Hurtado? Uh, we do have one person, uh, LKG. OK. LKG, you have three minutes. You are now able to speak. Hey, am I coming through? Yes, we can hear you. Um, okay, well, I actually just have a question. Is the um, initial July 1st rule making deadline still in place, or if it's been extended, I may have missed that. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, generally, the board isn't able to respond um, because of the constraints on a public meeting, for which I apologize. But we do have an agenda item coming up from the rulemaking process subcommittee, and I'm hoping we'll hear more about the schedule then. Thank you very much for your comment. Do we have further public comments? No, not at this time. OK. I'll wait for just a second. I can't quite get over being a law professor. <laughs> All right, any further questions or comments from board members before we move on? Okay, seeing none, 
We will move to agenda item number four, um, which is the Startup and Administration Subcommittee. Ms. Sierra and I will be providing an update for that. Um, as a brief reminder, in the June 14th, 2021 and September 7th and 8th, 2021 board meetings, we formed advisory subcommittees. Bagley Keene allows for advisory subcommittees of up to two people who can act in this advisory capacity for the board. Um, as you can see from the agenda, we have several advisory subcommittees reporting today. Um, the Startup and Administration Subcommittee is made up of Ms. Sierra and myself. And um, our subcommittee mentioned in the board's September 7th and 8th, 2021 board meeting that board policies related to incompatible activities were on our list of topics to consider and bring to the board in our advisory capacity. Our implementing statute um, prohibits the board from engaging in incompatible activities. And a reasonable question is, what does that mean and how do we comply? At that time, the board in September of last year, the board had already voted um, to put our conflicts of interest policy out for public comment. And um, in October, October 18th, the board finally approved the conflicts of interest policy. The subcommittee has since sought advice and guidance for the related issue of avoiding incompatible activities. We asked if we could have guidance ready for this meeting in light of Mr. Lay's request on the February 17th, 2022 board meeting um, for an upcoming agenda item on these topics. I'm very grateful to our acting general counsel, Mr. Brian Souble, who analyzed this issue for us and prepared an incompatible activity statement for us to discuss today. I'll just briefly note that Mr. Thompson and I have signed a similar statement um, because we signed it upon our appointment by the governor and this one is intended to be compatible with our current commitments. So with that, I will hand it over to Mr. Soublay. Thank you, Chair Urban. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to the materials for agenda item number four. These are in the board members meeting packets available as handouts for the in-person meeting attendees and also available on CPPA's website on the meetings and events page under this meeting. The conflict of interest and in incompatible activity laws are grounded in the idea that personal or private interests and considerations should not enter into the decision-making process of government officials. The CPRA at California Civil Code section 1798.199.15 states that members of the CPPA board shall remain free from external influence, whether direct or indirect, and shall neither seek nor take instructions from another, and to refrain from any action incompatible with their duties and engaging in any incompatible occupation, whether gainful or not, during their term. Civil Code section 1798.199.15 does not specifically provide guidance as to what constitutes a conflict of interest or an incompatible activity for CPPA board members. Today, I'm focusing on the issue of incompatible activities because as Chair Urban previously pointed out, the board has already adopted a conflict of interest policy and board members have complied with the requirements of the Political Reform Act, which focuses on conflicts arising from financial interests. However, the concept of incompatible activities is broader than a member's financial interests. The document I'm presenting for the board's consideration is intended to assist the board in understanding the CPRA prohibition on engaging in incompatible activities and to memorialize that understanding in a written format. Under the provisions of California Government Code section 19990, all state officers and employees are prohibited from engage, engaging in any activity or enterprise that is clearly inconsistent, incompatible, in conflict with, or inimical to their duties as state officers. Section 19990 requires state agencies to determine those activities which, for employees under their jurisdiction, are incompatible with their duties as state officers or employees. However, the provisions of Government Code Section 19, 19990 do not specifically apply to members of governing boards. In our case, with the absence of specificity as to what constitutes an incompatible activity in the CPRA, the list of activities contained in Section 19990, by analogy,
can be looked at as to the type of matters that are considered incompatible with the duties of a member of the board. As Chair Urban mentioned, board members appointed by the governor have already signed the governor's incompatible activity statement, which adopts the bulk of the requirements set forth in Government Code 19990 and served as the model for the uh, matter, the document for your consideration today. This document that is submitted for your consideration is intended to provide the examples of incompatible activities that is lacking in the CPRA. And it is with that in mind that I have suggested that the board adopt this document as their statement as to incompatible activities that would be applicable to the board. I'm available to respond to any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Soublé. Um, please, uh, board members, stick your hand out if you have a question or a comment. Okay. Mr. Way, please. Yeah, so, you know, I, I took a look at the incompatible activity statement, and thank you for preparing it. Um, and, you know, for the most part, I, I, I think this is great to have some detail. Um, but my, I am concerned that this appears to be designed for um, a type of board where, you know, they're like a full time working for the agency. So, as you know, my regular job as senior legal counsel at the Green Lighting Institute involves uh, privacy issues, which is why, you know, I'm an expert on these, these types of topics. So uh, with that said, um, I, when looking at number five, right, performance of an act other than in his or her capacity as a board member, knowing that such an act may be later subject directly or indirectly to the control, inspection, review, audit, enforcement by the agency, uh, I find to be um, kind of kind of troublesome um, because there may be acts that I do in my capacity, my day job, that may be uh, indirectly subject to review by the agency, but not necessarily incompatible. So I would suggest um, editing number five to say performance of an incompatible act. And, and just, just for, for sake of example, um, you know, in my role, I'll ask you know, agencies to co cooperate with each other, right? So that may be asking Department of Justice or Department of Fair Employment and Housing to work with the CPPA um, so that they can better enforce consumer rights and protect consumer rights. Um, that may end up, you know, any agreement between the agencies may be under my review, but in my opinion, that is not an incompatible act within my capacity as a board member. So therefore, um, I would suggest we add to number five performance of an incompatible act just to make sure that um, that we cover those kind of situations. Thank you, Mr. Lay. So insert incompatible yes, in between number five. and an act yes. in number five. That is your suggestion. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Soublé, do you have further comments on that? I no. thought this apply, wouldn't apply to something like the Green Line Institute because they're a nonprofit. Correct. But under under the current form of a law, it wouldn't apply to Green Lining because they're, they don't fall within the ambient of our statute. Uh -huh. Um, so my suggestion would be that maybe it would be a revised statement if at some point in the future that that eventuality does happen. Um, but one thing to keep in mind, even though we changed the wording here, um, you still have the, the, the issue that for just about everyone else in the state, the, the, word, uh, the word incompatible isn't necessarily uh, inserted into the statute or into to their, to their policies. And so it's just that on a public speaking basis, people will still may have in mind that they're looking at for, oh, for any act, not necessarily just an incompatible act. Yeah, and I, I would say, you know, to that, you know, this is, I guess our board setup is a little bit unique within California in that, you know, we, we do have adjudicatory powers, right. but we are kind of a part-time, you know, per diem based board where we have other responsibilities and roles. So I guess some deviation, I think, would make sense in this, in this instance. The, the, uh, the entire part of 1990 that this is drawn from is about incompatible, right? That's correct. So we, we're really talking about incompatible acts. That's correct. In any case. Okay. So it's kind of assumed in there, even without the word being there, it would be an incompatible act. Right. Yeah. But Mr. Lay would feel more comfortable. I would feel more yeah. comfortable if, yeah, we if put that word. there. So it's just that there are some acts that are not incompatible that may indirectly influence the agency. I and see. I just right. want to make sure that we, we cover those. Uh, okay. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Ms. Delatore, were you, I couldn't. Actually, uh, yes, thank you. 
So I had an opportunity to connect with Mr. Lay and also have a conversation with Mr. Souffle. And it was suggested to me that, that I might um, come with edits that I had to suggest. You can pass it all the way out. I have Are there one for everyone? Yeah. Cool. So these two pages. So. There's four oh, there's more copies. Oh. Okay, I understand now. <laughs> uh, right. So I, um, and I had the same impression that um, I generally support the policy, but there were some ways in which the um, language was not tailored to us. And so one of the first things that was confusing to me is this a policy. And if it is a policy, then in the first paragraph, the only thing that I think we need to say is the members of the board of the California Privacy Protection Agency have adopted this statement as the incompatible activities statement for the members of the California Private Protection Agency board the rest of the language is not going to have any historical context. I, I appreciate it being part of the draft so that we understand what was in the mind of the subcommittee, but I don't think it's um, necessarily for the policy. And then on the second um, paragraph, there's just a couple of um, typos, no employment activity or enterprise shall be engaged in by a member of the board that might result in or create the appearance of resulting in any um, of the following. So those are just small typos. I didn't have any comment to one, two, or three, but when I was reading four, it became apparent to me that this was coming from a, a generic um, language, um, receiving or accepting money in or any other compensation from anyone other than the state. In our case, it should be instead of the state as provided by California Civil Code section, that's the citation to our per diem that will tailor that statement to us. Obviously, no other state organization will be expected to pay board members for their services um, on the board. So I, I want to pause there and, and get some uh, feedback from the rest of the members. On Thank that. you, Ms. De La Troy. Uh, Mr. Sibley, do you, uh, Mr. Dalju, do you have this? No, we don't. Have, we don't have a copy. Okay. So, does one of you want to maybe share one, and maybe I can share with Mr. Thompson or with Ms. Sierra? So, and then just in terms of getting materials to the public. Is there one that we can make available to the public? Well, we have several, so. Um, you could use this. You can make this one. I don't know how you would do it. But. Can I walk across here? We can just share them down, we'll, we'll post it on. and we can post it. So yeah. for everyone at home, um, uh, apologies. I was not sure as to how many copies we needed because I was not sure that two of the members were going to physically be here. So I right. Made a limited okay. number of copies. Okay. So thanks everyone for indulging while we pause to. I I read it. Okay. Can glance at it as necessary. Okay. Um, so, um, Mr. Souble, Ms. De La Torre has um, discussed her proposed changes through Section 4. How would you like to proceed? Would you um, like to comment? Would you like us to comment? I think that we should comment as a board, right? That that's the draft for discussion for the board. Well, it is, but there's also legal, you know, legal. So it's typos, and then just the first paragraph, eliminating the language as not relevant. Yes. So um, would anyone like to comment on those first, down to number four? Yeah. All right. Yeah, the typos. Seem, yeah. You're correcting those. Seem fine to me. Um, and then, yeah, the just simplifying the beginning paragraph doesn't seem to change anything substantially. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Ms. Sierra? Yeah. And it seems, you know, well, I thought the beginning was helpful for context, but it, ultimately, I don't think these are substantive changes. And I think for number four, is I think, implied that compensation or per diem would be involved, but I think clarifying that is not substantive, so. I don't have objections to those changes. Thank you, Ms. Sierra. Um, well, I will say I actually like having the statute cited because I think it conveys the legal basis. Um, 
I don't think there's a need um, to say, to describe the governor appointee statement, which applies to Mr. Thompson to me. That seems descriptive. Um, I don't feel terribly strongly about it, but I think citing the statute is, is helpful. Um, changing top typos makes perfect sense, of course. Mm -hmm. Number four, I actually don't read it the way I understood you to be describing it, Ms. De La Torre. I read this as money or consideration from somebody else, somebody else, like a third party, a company, oh. a regulated entity, grandma, I don't know, um, but somebody outside of the state paying one of us to right. do something. And so I think this is quite important. To leave the state? Um, yes. So to me, there's a, and many agencies within the state that have nothing to do with the board, and I'm not completely sure that some of them might or might not be regulated even by CCPA, because if you're an entity that's created for profit and that can exist, that will not be appropriate at all. And in any way, the, our compensation is set by statute, right? Are we expecting that we will receive any compensation other than the per diem? Well, the, no, but that's from the state. The per diem comes from the state. We are part of the state. Right, right. I apologize. I think I might be missing the... Right. The, um, I think the idea would be that if a different agency paid us, that right. would technically be within the state, um, and then technically a allowed under this incompatible activity statement, whereas if you put the per diem... You're making it clear. Getting paid from a different agency doing something privacy-related would be incompatible. Right. Oh, I see. Yeah. So you've expanded it. No, I... She, she's actually I, narrowed it. Narrowed it. Which oh. was yeah. basically what the concept... So, for example, suppose... Um, the Department of Financial Protection and Innovation paid you something for work that you're already doing under your per diem for CPPA. Under this amendment, it's like, no, you're only supposed to be receiving the per diem. Yeah. And so by citing to the specific, instead of taking away the state, which could be any other agency, you're making clearer that your only compensation for doing this board work comes from the per diem, which is kind of, ref which is referenced in the statute. So right. she's so, just uh, basically narrowing the understanding of who was paid. Right, and broadening the effect of number four, which is yes. what I meant. Yes, right. Okay, I understand now. Thank you. Ms. De La Torre, do you want to talk about the other ones? Are, are there further comments from the board? Okay. I think Mr. Thompson might have comments. Or... Oh, I, I felt comfortable either way on number four. Uh, I mean, what I understand it to mean is we, are, we take certain actions as a board and we are compensated for them by the state or by a subset under this our per diem. Right. And the notion is that we shouldn't be getting money from an, a third party entity for taking those actions. Exactly. Right. Um, so I'm comfortable either way. Okay. I'm just tailoring it to us. This is language that was basically copy pasted from a section of, of the government code. So, and then on five, I had an opportunity to have a conversation with Mr. Lay, so I added incompatible there. That's the um, reference that he wanted to add. When I read number five, the first thing that I thought about is I myself um, exercising my rights under CCPA, which I do all of the time. That's a performance of an act in order that my capacity as a board member that I know will be subject to the supervision of the agency. I know that it's not within the spirit of the law to limit that, but I thought it was appropriate to just mention there that that uh, section should not be read in any way to limit the ability of the members of the board um, in um, exercising their, their privacy rights. Okay, and then for the public, I'm going to just read what you inserted, mm -hmm. if that's all right. Um, so number five, um, with the proposed edits from Ms. De La Torre, would say performance of an incompatible act in other than his or her capacity as a board member, knowing that such an act may later be subject directly or indirectly to the control, inspection, review, audit, or enforcement by the agency. This shall not be read to limit. So as to limit. So as to limit. Oh dear, I have actually. I can, I can read it. So as to limit or preclude. preclude a board member from exercising his or her privacy rights pursuant to CCPA. Right. 
Um, comments or questions from the board on this one? This I, makes sense to me. Yeah, I think yeah. the incompatible part would capture that last <laughs> sentence, but I mean, no, it doesn't hurt to, to be even more specific. So I'm fine either way. Right, I think we both had the same reaction and I think Mr. Lay solved it one way and I solved it in a different way, but they're, um, both edits are compatible. And then in, in six, and I'm gonna go ahead, uh, if the chair is comfortable, mm -hmm. I'm gonna read it out loud. Yes, that makes sense. So the number six says, receiving or accepting directly or indirectly any gifts, including money, any service, gratuity, favor, entertainment, hospitality, loan, or any other thing of value from anyone who is doing or seeking to do business of any kind with the agency or whose activities are regulated or controlled in any way by the agency under the circumstances, under circumstances from which it reasonably could be inferred that the gift was intended to influence the member in his or her official duties or was intended as a reward for any official action on his or her part. So when I read that, and I've been you know, trying to be as careful as possible when I engage with organizations that are um, regulated, the thing that came to mind uh, for me was, um, and I'm just gonna give an example, I attend conferences uh, sometimes and sometimes conferences are sponsored by organizations that might be regulated. And those organizations um, sometimes do cover the cost of the flight and, and the cost of a hotel if it's um, somewhere other than um, where the person that's speaking at the conference resides. That to me is not necessarily something that should be read as um, influencing my um, ability to be independent as a member. And, uh, but however, it, it came to my mind that if that organization that is sponsoring is in some way under supervision by the agency, I would like to avoid even engaging in that so that it cannot be perceived by others. So I might not be aware that an organization that is inviting me or is sponsoring a conference that I'm attending it's uh, under audit. So I just, uh, for uh, clarity added there, in order to better enable the board member to avoid any appearance of impropriety, the agency shall provide to each board member a periodically updated list of organizations under investigation or audit that will enable me to be alerted so that if an organization is in that situation, I can be even more careful than I'm regularly are when um, engaging in any um, activity like attending conferences. So that's where the edit came to my mind. I don't know if we can maybe, um, chairperson, take feedback from the rest of the um, Yes, thank you, Ms. De La Torre, and, and thank you for so thoughtfully approaching this. Um, in this instance, I would like to ask Mr. Soublet to comment for two reasons. One is, my understanding is, we are bound by the general state conflict of interest rules, and those cover things like flights and meals and, and that kind of thing. So we're actually prohibited or very limited in accepting a variety of things and the details are quite complicated. I don't have them right in front of me. And then secondly, investigations and audits will probably be, well, there's a part of enforcement and we are going to have to work through enforcement rules, but generally, we are the decision makers, the board, and thus we would actually not have insight and should not have insight into investigative targets up to the point that they come to us as decision makers. Is that correct? That's correct. And on the first point, um, there are rules, and that's the political reform act conflict of interest uh, part where um, that deal with travel and programs and things like that for conferences. And that more, deals more appropriately with what would be considered a, con a financial conflict of interest. So you're already under an obligation with respect to that because of the, 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 the FPPC's um, conflict of interest requirements and the reporting requirements that go with your annual Form 700s. Um, the other issue is that when we're in an enforcement action, since the board is the ultimate decision maker on that, they can't participate in um, or know of a lot about of what is happening in the investigative investigatory process because then that can jeopardize the participation in the final decision making with respect to it. So for those two reasons, I would be a little concerned about adding this extra language to that paragraph. Hey, may I ask a question on that? So um, this is um, 
I'm just trying to draw comparisons here. In the criminal um, process, a judge is involved from the beginning of the process until the end. And all the knowledge that that judge might accumulate from the arrangement, all of those stages, doesn't preclude the judge from sitting in the trial and making a decision that could be a determination of whether somebody goes to jail or not. And so it's a little um, surprising to me that, and I'm not, I'm not um, expecting that we will be involved. I don't think it will be appropriate for the board to be involved, but simply the awareness of the fact that an organization is under investigation, I think that what you're saying is that will create some kind of inability for me to be impartial when I'm... Uh, can you elaborate on that? Well, we are talking about two completely different processes because under the Administrative Procedures Act, that is a whole different procedure. And the, the decision makers um, actually come in at the end of the process. There's an investigation, and then there's a hearing process of which the board would not participate in. Mm -hmm. And so, the, and, and then at the end of that process, the board adopts the decision that comes after all of that, that preliminary work. Now there's case law that, that uh, it, it is inappropriate for, for the decision maker to be involved in the earlier stages of the process because they can influence on that, on that process. So for those reasons, that's why I'm concerned about without taking a little bit stronger look at this, I would be concerned about, you know, uh, having to maintain a list to keep you up to date on, you know, what are the matters that are under investigation, because you are part of that process, but it's at the end of that process. Could you elaborate more on that case law that you mentioned? What is the case law that indicates that involvement? And what is involvement? Because here we I don't have the exact site for the case, but I can tell you it's probably Morongo, um, but I don't have the Supreme Court site sitting with me right now for that case. No, no, and I think we're putting you on the spot and you're just um, doing your best to provide us advice. But if there's a need maybe to do a little research, um, we could allow for time for that, uh, maybe ask the DOJ for a report. I just, to me, it doesn't stand to reason that knowing the name, not in being involved in, in, in an investigation, but just knowing the name of the organizations, which will be really helpful for me to avoid the appearance of impropriety, will interfere with the ability of a board member to be an impartial judge if, if the case actually comes up for resolution. Well, two suggestions. One, since we haven't really laid out what our enforcement policies and procedures are gonna be and how we're gonna go about them, it may be early right now to be talking about that as a consideration. So with, with adopting a policy today, which can always be amended in the future, um, that is one possibility. Um, um, and the other issue is that, that um, I, I don't want to get into a lot of discussions about what we want, might be including and Absolutely. how we do our procedures into the future. I would right. just caution that I wouldn't want to do something now that really we don't have to consider with until we get to the point of when we're starting to outline how we're going to do our enforcement procedures. I just basically want to be in the best position to avoid the appearance of impropriety. And I think that this will be a tool that will be of assistance to me. Um, so maybe if it's appropriate to ask for a legal memo on, on, on this topic, it will, be, it will be something that it will at least be helpful to me. Right. And I think one of our other goals is as we're approaching the, the phase where we want to get to the point of actually promulgating our first set of regulations to have this clear understanding prior to us doing that. And I would not like to see that good work get delayed by waiting for some further research on an issue that's not going to come up for us into the future. Thank you, Mr. Sible. I would also like to add that as I read number six, again, this is covered. We are already bound by rules related to what we can and cannot accept and under what circumstances. Mm -hmm. Um, and when we might be able to accept something but have to disclose it on the Form 700 um, versus when we can't accept it at all. So I think that those rules help us, help keep us from any appearance of impropriety because I, they are quite strict. Now, and my point is that even following those strict rules, mm -hmm. I could be placed in a situation where there's an appearance of impropriety because I am receiving that allowable um, amount from an organization that is later known to have been 
under investigation without me knowing that it was under investigation, if that makes sense. It does make sense, but there's another appearance of impropriety if the decision maker knows the targets of investigation. So in a criminal case or in a civil case, in civil courts in the United States, for example, um, nobody knows any target until it gets to court, until the prosecutor brings charges. Um, and the right, I'm saying under investigation or audit. Right, and that is exact precisely what is protected so that the decision maker it does not have the appearance of having been involved in the investigation, help choose the investigation targets, um, have some interest in how those were chosen, but only in the decision. Now, I'm not an expert on criminal law, so but that's just my sense of it, is that there is a potential concern for impropriety, appearance of impropriety, obviously, um, not actual impropriety, but it goes in both directions, and that the usual rules under the APA that would prevent the decision maker from having input into the investigation and investigatory process are intended to prevent the second form of impropriety, if that makes sense. But yeah. for clarity, yeah, I'm, I'm not saying that we should be involved in the investigation in any way. I'm just, I'm just um, looking for a way to put myself in a better position to avoid the yeah, appearance. Thank Go you. Ahead, uh, and, and I have, have a suggestion. Mr. and then Mr. Thomas and then and, and, and Mr. Blake, okay. And just a suggestion, we're, for the legal, we're always available to provide input and advice on any of these types of issues. You know, like if you have, have an issue, for example, what do I need to disclose on my Form 700, I, or this activity is coming up, we're always available to help provide some guidance with respect to that. You know, just, just the document is necess not necessarily the, the entire universe of what could be incompatible. And so you may always in the future have questions and would always be available to assist with that. But I'm confused about that because if it's my own incompatibility, shouldn't I look for my um, counsel to, I mean, your counsel to the agency, right? Right. So sh wouldn't there be a conflict for you if you were providing legal advice to board members on incompatibilities? Well, we always get called upon to ask for legal advice with respect to issues. We, I mean, even earlier this year, we provided advice on uh, what's acceptable to put in the Form 700s and et cetera. So I don't see a conflict necessarily there. Um, but if you, uh, anytime you have questions on matters like this, you can always ask. If we're not a, a capable of providing you a response, you also have the availability to get your own counsel to provide you with, with advice that's, on that. That's what makes sense to me. But um, just going back to the- But edit. before we go to that, Ms. De La Torre, I'd like to give Mr. Thompson and Mr. Lay a chance to make their Please. comments. Okay. A, a couple of things on this. One is, I, I see what the, the goal that you're trying to to drive at is the way I read this, there's there's two, there's a couple of different issues. One about there's an information asymmetry in that an entity under investigation knows it's under investigation, but you don't. It's exactly. And so there's there's an right. imbalance there. They might be motivated to take an act exactly. that's informed by information they possess that you don't. So and I, I think that's what you're yeah. trying to try solve. to avoid that. Right. The way I read the way this is worded is you can't accept a thing of value, I'll just summarize it, that could be reasonably inferred that the thing of value was given to you to influence you. If you don't know that they're under investigation, then it can't be reasonably inferred that it was that you accepted it for the purposes of influence because you didn't even know that they were under investigation. They might have given it with that intent, but you didn't receive it with that intent because you were unaware of their, their being under investigation. But Right, that's why it protects the process to prevent the decision maker from knowing who is a target of investigation. It protects targets of investigation as well from, you know, having that information be um, more broadly known. For example, maybe they end up not, right. the investigation gets dropped, but it protects the decision maker from the appearance of influence. But then you should say, Receive, under circumstances for which it's reasonable, it could be inferred that it was received to influence, right? Not intended, because I don't necessarily know the intention. And I think that in any That's case, a, yeah. it doesn't cover the public um, awareness right. and, and the suspicion that the public might have if I find myself in that situation unknowingly. Thank you, Ms. De La Troy. Mr. Lay? Oh, no, I, I think Mr. Thompson kind of um, stated kind of where I, I, I understand what the 
what the edits are for, but after hearing both sides of it, um, I think the, the ignorance, our ignorance actually does protect us from those inferences. The public may not, uh, may have, you know, may think, may, may appear impropriety, but you know, we can just say like we didn't know. Um, so, because it yeah. says, or create the appearance of resulting. I yeah. mean, then maybe we need to take that out yeah. of the first um, sentence. Is that what we're saying? That we don't necessarily want to avoid creating the appearance? Okay, it says reasonably could be, could, from which it reasonably could be inferred mm -hmm. that the gift was intended. Right, but the first paragraph says no employment activity or enterprise shall be engaged in by a member of the board that might result in or create the appearance of resulting in. So how do I avoid creating the appearance of resulting in if I'm not aware? We could take that out of the first um, sentence if that's... But I would prefer to be in a position where I can avoid the appearance. Where does that appearance mean? Further yeah. comments? Yes, Ms. Sierra. I mean, on that point, I mean, this in the beginning, there's a general clause, but number six narrows it to what reasonably could be inferred. So I mm -hmm. think that there's a protection right there. Um, and I think the spirit of this is what we're knowingly engaging in something, not something that we're doing that we didn't realize we were doing, um, as long as we're taking reasonable steps. And I, the point I also think is very important, um, Mr. Souble, that you made, that our agency hasn't yet finalized our guidelines around enforcement and, you know, and how the enforcement branch will be working with the other branches of our agency and with the board. So I'm very concerned about adding any language here now that could then impede what the agency um, develops as its best practice. And so what I would suggest is that we leave six as is and we can, after the agency has, has adopted this enforcement protocols, if any of us would like to discuss revisiting it, we would have an opportunity to do that. I think that would be the most prudent way to to uh, proceed. Thank you, Ms. Sierra. I had one I, other observation yes, that um, on the, because the, the proposed edit is around investigations or audits. I just want to make sure, Mr. Souple, that I understand the intention here correctly. Under, and correct me if where I misstate, under the Fair Political Practices Act and our filing of Forum 700, we can accept things of value up to a certain threshold and disclose them. Mm -hmm. Correct. This adds an additional requirement prohibiting the acceptance of things of value from regulated entities if it could be reasonably inferred that the regulated entity was providing it as uh, to influence or as a reward for action, right? Correct. So we're, we're going beyond regulated entity X wants to take, wants to pay my travel to a conference under what we have currently, I could do that and disclose it, right? And then it's publicly available. If we adopt this, I could, I don't know whose reasonable inference is required here, but if it could be reasonably inferred that the travel to the conference was meant to influence, then that would be prohibited. Right, if that is an under investigation and, and or the subject of an enforcement action, if it can be inferred that they are paying for you to do that in order to influence what your decision may mm -hmm. ultimately be in that matter, Yes, that would be a problem here. Not only do you have the FDEC issue of reporting that that travel and reporting that in, that income as the way it, it is phrased, there, it would be something that would be prohibited under here because it is right. it is intended right. to influence you in your ultimate decision. So, the sunshine rule is sun you know sunshine is the best disinfectant. If if we are regulated in entity X and entity X pays for me to go to a conference. Somebody could say, well, you were regulating that, that, that entity mm -hmm. and I now know through your disclosure that you were paid, they paid for you to go to wherever. What's the thing, well, whose reasonable inference is, is it there? I think it would be the reasonable person's inference. Okay. You know, it's like, is it reasonable to assume that an entity has paid you in order to influence a decision that you may make on the board? Now, mind you, there's, 
if you think about if any business that's subject to the you know the provisions of the laws that we're enforcing is an entity, right? But it's them paying for you to come to a conference that they may be hosting. Can it be reasonably inferred that it is to influence you in some action that is before the board? And that's and that's the way you need to think about it. That that seems it seems pretty. I I would want some more refined guidance around that to to understand it. I don't particularly like going to conferences, so that would not be an effective way of influencing <laughs> me. Thank you, Mr. Thompson and Sierra. And just briefly, I think you had already mentioned that there are limitations in any of that yep. on right. accepting, you know, um, travel or payments for attending conferences and things. Of that yeah, nature. there are travel um, honoraria uh, rules, and then there are uh, gift limits um, yeah. that are already part of the of the uh, political reform act. Yeah. Uh, so one one question on that um, that is kind of related. But it will be helpful if you have the answer. In my case, I I do um, get invited, and I think um, Mr. Lane might be in that situation as an expert, not because of my role as a board member, but because of my um, capacity as an expert to participate in in conferences usually organized by universities. Is there a difference from me participating or being invited as an expert versus me being invited because I'm a member of the board in terms of those rules, or is the rules apply in you know across the board, whatever capacity I'm invited? But you have to remember that the, the second leg of it is that invitation intended to influence a decision of you as a member of the board on a matter that the board would be taking an enforcement action on. And so is the university inviting you to attend in a panel on, on privacy, is that intended to influence a decision that you as a board member would make in an enforcement proceeding? I, I don't think you, I maybe not didn't ask the question correctly, but let's table it because maybe I can um, have a private conversation with sure. you and to better understand that difference. Okay. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Mr. Souble, um, can you enlighten us as to the difference between this language and what's already required? Um, this language if is, any. well, what's the language that as it was drafted, it is very similar to the language that is in the, the statement that you signed um, as an appointee of the governor's office. Mm -hmm. The only changes I may have uh, substituted out the word the state for board or agency um, or official employee for, for board member. But generally, it is identical to the statement that has been signed by appointees of the governor's office. So there's not, other than those minor changes, there's not any difference. Thank you. And um, is it is it restating the law, basically, I guess is what I'm asking. It is, it is a restatement of those provisions. Generally, what Government Code 19990 says, it, you know, gives a preamble about avoiding the conflicts. And then it says um, uh, appointing authorities are to adopt an, a, a conflict of interest of policy, which should include, and it includes this universe. Now, it can include more what it lists in, in Government Code Section 19990, these elements. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I think now would be a good time for me to see if I ha can summarize the conversation and where we are, and then we can discuss where we might go next. Um, so, um, Ms. De La Torre has recommended removing a fair amount of the descriptive language from the first paragraph, including the quotations from the relevant statutes and also um, the descriptive statement that this is similar to the statement that governor's appointees, which is myself and Mr. Thompson, um, have signed. On the second paragraph, um, Ms. De La Torre has proposed uh, two changes which change typos, um, uh, adding the word in between engaged and by, and uh, re, um, revising the word and to any. She has also proposed revising section four in order to narrow the scope of what board members can do and expand the scope of the provision by changing the words other than the state to other than as provided in California Civil Code section 1798.199.25, which for everyone um, uh, listening at home who 
don't know the statute as well as we all do at this point, um, is our per diem, um, the, the part of the statute that sets out the per diem, um, which is the honorarium for board members. She also suggests that on uh, section number five, as does Mr. Lay, to insert the word incompatible between an and act in the first line, and also to add at the end of this provision, this shall not be read so as to limit or preclude a board member from exercising his or her privacy rights pursuant to the CCPA. And my understanding of Ms. De La Torre's reasoning is that this is so it's abundantly clear um, that we are able to opt out of sale and ask for a correction, et cetera, all of the various things that um, any Californian is allowed to do under the CCC CCPA. And then with regards to section number six, Ms. De La Torre has suggested adding um, a sentence to the end in order to better enable the board member to avoid any appearance of impropriety, the agency shall surprise, provide to each board member a periodically updated list of organizations under investigation or audit. And as I understand Ms. De La Torre's reasoning, this is so um, board members are able to avoid interactions or accepting anything um, from an entity that may be under investigation or audit. Even if it was customary and it was not something that might alert us to um, any impropriety and, and it right. will be within the rules of um, the fair political practice. Uh, I would like to avoid receiving any um, or participating in any situation where there's an or organization that later might um, find themselves before us for enforcement. Thank you. I just want to check, uh, is our sound coming through all right? We're sort of talking to each other and not into the microphone. Okay, thank you. Um, and I think that there is support, certainly for the typo changes, um, probably uh, for removing the perambular language. Um, I'm the one who likes those first sentences, but <laughs> I, I don't feel that strongly about it. Um, and also for the change to number four. And Mr. Sultani? I'm sorry to interrupt your process. If it's possible, I'd also like to just make one point and one suggestion too. Uh, yes, please. One is that if we share a list of entities under consideration, there is the question of whether um, that would need to then be public because it would be materials going to the board. Um, right. And then the other thing, um, and uh, this, this came from staff, but a suggestion, would be to fix um, all the language that says his or her to their, to be gender neutral. There's a 2018 um, concurrent resolution that suggests using gender neutral pronouns uh, in, in um, legislation. So those are just our two points. Okay, thank you. Um, just to get a sense, gender neutral pronouns, good with everyone, yes, mm -hmm. of course, thank you. Um, all right, so I, I think that the source of our discussion is mostly, actually, let me back up. I apologize, Ms. De La Torre. Did you have other changes? If you go to the last page, there's a, a whole signature block that doesn't make sense in a policy that's going to be approved by the board. We would simply vote to approve. I don't see what sense it makes to sign a policy that we're voting to approve. We never signed them before when we approved the code of conduct. That would, I would have to ask Mr. Souble or Mr. Dalju about it. it. It still makes sense to sign it anyway, um, as we already have board members who've had to, had gone through the process of signing a, a document like this. And if there are future board members and we have them come on board, they would not have taken part in, the, in this decision to vote for it now. And so right. that, I thought that. about that. It would make sense in the future for board members that do not approve policies when they are onboarded to sign that they understand that they have received all of the policies. That's what I thought the paragraph was uh, for in the draft. In this particular case, if we are voting to approve, I think the appropriate way of handling it will be taking the vote and then we don't have a secretary of the board, maybe we need one, but 
the, uh, either the general counsel or the secretary of the board will certify that the document was adopted. It's in general what I have seen done in boards. It, it just doesn't make sense to propose as a board and approve something and then say, I have read and understood. I, I was confused but, at the beginning about this document, whether it was a self-declaration or a policy. Policies do not include the signature of individuals when they are approved, they are but not But you're defined. approving it as the board's incompatible, incompatible right. activities policy and right. an incompatibility statement is really what the document is phrased as. It is the incompatible activities statement. Right. And you are signing that you are, are, are agreeing, you have read it and understand it and are agreeing to the provisions of the statement. Right, we are adopting it. That's my point that is not necessary. But you're adopting you, it Ms. as the statement which you would be agreeing to sign to. Thank, thank you, yeah. Ms. Delatroy and Mr. Soublé, Ms. Sierra? Yeah, I that just wanted to underscore that too. Is I think the fact that I think if we were making an agreement, one thing is if you know, there's maybe a partial vote you know, uh, for this, you know, it's unanimous, may not be unanimous, but I think this underscores that everybody regardless then is going to agree to it. Thank okay. you, Ms. Sierra. One so, other thing on that, um, so I don't, I don't have a problem with signing it, um, but should the staff sign it as well? Should this not be an incompatible activity statement for the entire agency, not just the board? We already have. Okay, and does it mirror this? Because, because that we have to sign the one um, that is is geared for state employees. Okay, and so we've we've already it's part of our appointment package. Thank you. Right, and that that's where this language comes from. It comes from a statute that. Right. Describes how it works for the um, state right. employees and officers. Thank you. All right. Um, so with that, with the question over the signature, that is all of the proposed changes. Yes, Ms. Yes. Delatroy. Okay. Does anybody else have any proposed changes or any sort of specific responses? Okay. Um, I really appreciate your attention to this, um, Ms. De La Torre, and your thoughtful suggestions. Um, also, Mr. Lay, with regards to Section 5, my view of the incompatible activity statement is that it is a public assertion by members of the board that we intend to um, take seriously our statutory prohibition to avoid incompatible activities. And I really appreciate that all of the suggestions have really tried to further that goal. I think it is also a message that the board is willing to hold itself to the same standard as our own employees and all state officials. So I strongly support this. I confess, Mr. Thompson and I already signed one. So I may be in a slightly different position in that I already made that decision but I think that I would support it either way. Um, and so I would really like for the board to be able to come to an understanding that allows us to adopt this incompatible activity statement today. Um, I, for my own part as a board member, support all of the changes up until section number six um, because I think that section number six restates important rules for which we are already bound, and I'm not comfortable with the idea of revealing investigated entities or audited entities. I don't know what those ramifications are. I would certainly be willing to have a further discussion, as staff have suggested, once we have more information about what enforcement practices will look like in some detail um, in the agency. Um, but for the reasons that, um, for these reasons, both legal under the APAA and usual practices, I understand it in criminal law, in, um, in criminal law um, and because of the fact that um, I just don't think that we should be making investigative, investigated entities public until the appropriate time, I cannot support that change. I also understand what Ms. De La Torre is saying with regards to the board adopting the policy. I do think there is value in signing it because again, it is an individual assertion that the board member has said to the public that they will be avoiding incompatible activities um, and that they will be following this policy. Um, I also take staff's point that we are five people 
And we are not the only five people who will ever serve on this board. We certainly hope. We hope there will be many, many after us. Um, so my proposal is that we adopt this as amended up to and through section five, and that we do not take the proposed amendment to section six, and that we maintain the signature um, requirement. That's my proposal, and I will um, ask it for discussion on that. I support that proposal. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. I support that as well. Thank you, Ms. Sierra. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Ms. De La Torre, is that? Could, yes, I, I support it. Would, could I ask for, uh, in between now and the time where we have that second conversation, could we ask for a legal memo so that we understand what are the limitations around that awareness? It will be helpful. I, I do not intend to create any liability for the agency. What I'm intending to is put myself in a situation where even where according to the rules, um, I'm doing something that is correct, I can create the appearance of impropriety. I absolutely hear you and understand and really appreciate the thoughtfulness. I propose that um, Ms. Sierra and I, as the startup and administration subcommittee, um, again, to sort of take this to the subcommittee and see if there is like a useful memo or something um, that we should try to help ask council to produce for us. I will appreciate if the DOJ will write a memo on this. I think their expertise will be very valuable in terms of understanding um, the, you know, the rules around that. Thank you very much. All right. Um, I do want to pause in case, because we've had, thank you everyone for the robust discussion so far. Um, are there, um, excuse me, is there public comment um, from anyone participating via Zoom on this agenda item? Thank you. Is there public comment from any members of the public participating here in person? All right. I'll wait for just a moment. Also let board members think a little bit more. Ms. Hurtado, no one? No, not okay. at this time. Thank you. In that case, may I have a motion to adopt the incompatible activity statement in substantially the form of the draft labeled for discussion for board discussion in today's meeting materials for agenda item four as amended according to today's discussion? I so move. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. May I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Mr. Lay. I have a motion from Ms. De La Torre and a second from Mr. Lay. Um, Ms. Hurtado, would you please perform the roll call vote? Okay. Ms. De La Torre? Aye. Mr. Lay? Aye. Ms. Sierra? Aye. Mr. Thompson? Aye. Ms. Urban? Aye. Five ayes and no nays. Thank you very much, Ms. Hurtado, and thank you very much, board members, for the robust discussion and careful thinking about our duties to the public. The motion has been approved by a vote of five to zero. Um, I will work with staff to ensure that we have the um, copy of the uh, draft incompatible activity statement with Ms. De La Torre and Mr. Lay's um, notations available to the public um, and we'll work with staff to make sure that the um, agreed upon statement is revised appropriately and disseminated. Wonderful, thank you everybody. Um, our next agenda item is agenda item number five, which is a, um, an update from the rulemaking process subcommittee, a course of action for upcoming rulemaking process. Before we dive in, I just wanna check and make sure everybody would like to go ahead, no one needs a break. Good, okay, Good. wonderful. This is our second advisory subcommittee report. As a bit of background, um, uh, on June 14th, 2021, the board formed a regulations subcommittee to advise on the agency's upcoming rulemaking. That subcommittee was comprised of this Ms. De La Torre and me. In the September 7th and 8th, 2021 meeting, Ms. De La Torre and I recommended dissolving our subcommittee and for the board to form three separate subject matter-based subcommittees to continue to advise the board on the agency's rulemaking. The board agreed, and we have um, for the past months now 
several months now, had these three um, subcommittees. The Rulemaking Process Subcommittee, which is Ms. De La Torre and Mr. Thompson. The Update of CCPA Rules Subcommittee, which is Ms. Sierra and myself. And the new CPRA Rules Subcommittee, which is Mr. Lay and Ms. De La Torre. The Rulemaking Process Subcommittee um, is going to go first today, and I will now turn things over to them. Thank you so much, Chairman. I will direct all of the board members to one of the handouts that has the slides for the presentation. They are not going to be projected, so there we go. Yeah. Mr. Lay has the slides. He has the slides. And I believe they will be projected for the members of the public. So in the first slide, what we <coughs> see is um, basically a slide that um, was used before in other presentations that describes the regular rulemaking process under California law. It starts with um, the notice of the proposed rulemaking, initial statement of reasons, and text of the regulations being released. That's something that has not happened yet here in the informal rulemaking process. The formal rulemaking process will start when that takes place. I don't know if um, there's an opportunity for um, board members that might have questions on the regular rulemaking to uh, maybe um, consult with Mr. Souple so that um, we can um, answer those questions if they have not been answered in prior presentations. If there are no questions, I would like to just move to the second slide. Are there any questions? Well, okay. So the um, second slide that we have here, it basically reflects two things. The line on top is a very summarized version of the slide that we just saw. It, it um, includes the different steps in the formal APA rulemaking process. The information that we see below is a, a view of what um, our subcommittee anticipates will happen in terms of the activities of the board connected with the APA rulemaking process. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, this, the uh, line on top first. As I mentioned before, the formal process starts with the notice of proposed rulemaking. After that, a 45-day public comment starts where we will be receiving comments from the public and we will have also an obligation to um, host public hearings. They are not that different, as I understand, from the hearings that we have conducted in the informal uh, process. Um, and depending on whether there's a decision to make some changes to the rules after we receive those comments, additional periods will open for public comments. And those um, might be 15 days or uh, 45 days, depending on the changes that are made. And that process basically repeats itself until we arrive to a moment where there are no more changes. That will be our final package. Um, one of the things that I, my subcommittee wanted to um, gather uh, feedback from the board about is uh, for that, um, 45-day public comment and public hearings. We have to make a determination as to the nature of the public hearings. Those are mandated by the APA, and we have basically two options. The first option will be to host those public hearings as board meetings. The second option is to host them as agency-driven meetings. The board meeting, um, if that's the path that we choose, will require a notice like the notice that we have for this board meeting, plus quorum. We will have to have um, quorum during the public hearings. The agency-driven process will require also notice under the APA, but will not require the board to be present or um, maintain a quorum. There is a flexible possibility that we also discuss within the subcommittee that will be hosting them as agency-driven but having some form of participation by members of the board to show that we are paying attention and we're listening to the, to the comments, which we will be able to do if they are agency driven, they will be recorded, transcripts will be available to us. We could actually attend as participants, even if it's not hosted as a board meeting. This option that is flexible is similar to the stakeholder sessions that were held with the chair participated just to demonstrate and, and to uh, show to the public our awareness of the fact that the meeting was taking place and that we are paying attention. So I wanna pause here 
and just gather a little bit of feedback from the board in terms of that, those two possibilities, you know, hosting these public hearings as board meetings or agency driven. They have different logistics requirements and it's important for the executive director to understand what is our preference. Thank you. I have a couple of questions. Is it anybody else? Okay. Um, I realize I do have a question on the process after all. So the public hearings or hearing or hearings, do they need to occur during the 45 day comment period or can they occur after? Let me uh, ask our general counsel to answer that question. No, they, they can occur after the 45-day comment period. A lot of agencies typically hold it on the, on the 45th day. Okay. Um, but I've also participated in holding the, 40, the, the public hearing after the 45th day. If you hold it after the, and remember the 45 days is a minimum comment period. Uh -huh. So if you do hold it, after the 45 days, of course, you're open for comments coming in up until the close of, of, your, of your hearing. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, and then I also had a question about the, um, the detail under the, under the chart, which is really helpful. Thank you. And I don't know where you found that graphic that fills up the half circle, but it's delightful. <laughs> uh, if you want to hold on to that uh, oh, okay. question, because I want to go through each one and then just gather uh, the feedback so that we have clarity. Okay, thank you. I think I might have been misunderstanding something to do with the hearings combined with this, so I think that this hearing you walk through it will help. Um, any other comments or questions before? In okay. terms of that, um, those options, board meetings or agency-driven for the public hearings, um, Remember, uh, Thompson and I have a little bit of a difference of opinion. We both see the advantages and disadvantages of, of, of both options. I tend to think about the agency-driven option as more flexible logistically for the agency while allowing our participation. But in some conversations that we have had, and maybe I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you have expressed the importance of our present and support and so in the public that we are listening which might be better um, display if we hold them as agency meetings so it it was really important for us to have that conversation as a board and see where everybody else was thank you Ms. De La Torre. Uh, Mr. Sultani did you have a yes if I could just clarify um, and, and just to um, just to clarify one piece which is the my understanding and please correct me if I'm wrong counsel is that two options are to hold them as a board meeting like this one and under the current rules we would do them in person uh, so those hearings would be also um, meetings of the board that would have uh, need to have quorum and happen in person or we could have them as staff driven as we did with the stakeholder sessions and board members could not participate um, board members could I understand potentially view them in the audience but we would not have knowledge of that and we could have less than a quorum we could have one member of the board present opening comments, but it would be a staff-driven event, and the board could not participate, just to clarify the, the, those words, and that would be the distance. If we have more than two members, or basically more than a subcommittee, a, a, a minority of the board, um, in those events, there would need to be board hearings or board, uh, board meetings. Those hearings would need to be board <laughs> meetings. Sorry. Thank you. And just to clarify, the way we treat, the way we handle public comment, the board would not really participate if it was a board meeting, public comment, it, it's generally a one-way delivery. So whether the board was meeting or the board was observing, functionally, I think that'd be the same. Okay, thank you. Are you asking Ms. De La Torre for our opinion or Mr. Thompson? I think I need to hear the whole picture, actually, if that's all right. Uh, Before I so do you wanna do you, is it for for myself I would like to kind of hear all of that. Okay, before perfect. I, yeah. We just have to remember at the end uh, to just okay. go back to this so that the um, executive director can, can have clarity in our preference. Um, so I was talking, I was describing the the APA process. What we see below is what we're proposing in terms of the meetings that we will be um, having as a board. So there's gonna be a first meeting, and this will be the meeting basically where the rules are released to the board and to the public. Um, in terms of that initial meeting, um, we don't have um, determination as to the timing for that meeting. 
because it could be potentially as early as June, but it depends on the path that the um, regulations take. Um, the executive director provided in his update information about this. There's a distinction between major regulations or whether they are not major regulations, or we're still trying to um, conclude our analysis on that. Um, so uh, the um, first meeting, we recommend that it should include a delegation of authority that is specific to the rulemaking for the executive director. Our recommendation is that all administrative steps related to rulemaking process be delegated on the executive director to the degree that is allowable under the law. And uh, that will include the scheduling and logistics for meetings to gather comments from the public, as well as approval of Form 399 mm -hmm. or the standard regulatory impact assessment, whichever document is needed for the rulemaking process. Um, our recommendation is that in that initial meeting, we could have the staff present the rules to the board and we can have a conversation about the rules and then take a um, decision to vote on whether to approve those rules to move forward, meaning they will be approved so that the agency can file the notice and we can open the formal um, period. We have a lot of flexibility in terms of how we organize the, the, the board meetings. We, we were thinking, does it make sense in that particular board meeting to go in depth into maybe discussion, different opinions that, um, or, or questions that board members will have? And our initial recommendation will be to stay away from that, to give the board time to really read through the rules, which we probably will receive just, you know, for, potentially days before, and schedule a second meeting. That's what you see as the second meeting uh, in, in this chart, where after we had the opportunity to go through the rules, maybe have conversations with the um, staff of the agency to better understand the different um, documents that will be presented to us, and we are ready to actually have that conversation as a board, we can engage more in depth into the discussion. Go ahead. I apologize. This is where I was a little confused. Okay. So that second meeting is not the same as the public hearing. Exactly. No, okay. it's, it will just be a board meeting for us as a board to have a conversation on, like we just had in the um, prior agenda meeting, potentially, right? Like obviously something much smaller, but we will all be prepared. We will have an opportunity to read the rules. We will have an opportunity to share with the staff what. Um, opinion we might have or what questions we might have. So we're kind of creating two meetings, the initial meeting to um, receive the rules, start the uh, rulemaking formal process so that the process can advance as quickly as possible, and then a second meeting to have more the in-depth conversation that will also guide um, the staff in terms of the positions that different board members might have on different points that might be included in that uh, package. Um, the board members can always choose to present their comments verbally at the meeting, um, and the staff can advise on, on, on how, or we could choose to um, prepare writings like policy statements. That would be each individual member making a determination as to how to best uh, present that uh, information to the other members. The purpose of this second meeting is really to allow board members to have the time to th think through um, the package that is going to be presented. Some of the board members are not going to have any knowledge of all of any of the rules that are presented. Some will have like partial knowledge of part of the rules, but not necessarily of the other of the other piece. And we thought it was important to allow for that. So um, let me pause here and gather feedback on, on the two points that I mentioned, actually the one point that I mentioned before, which is the delegation to the executive director. Just in general, um, do the other board members support this um, proposal to provide a delegation this as broad as possible to the executive director to deal with all of the administrative um, steps? Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. I support that. Nice. Mr. Lay? Yeah, I support that. Thank you. Yeah, I do as well. Okay. So perhaps we can direct at this point our general counsel to prepare that delegation mm -hmm. so that it is presented to us for approval. That sounds perfect. Now, 
Shall the rulemaking process subcommittee do that, or would you like me to work with Mr. Souble? I don't uh, mind. I, I, I don't know exactly, Mr. Souble, that delegation that we're talking about, does it need any feedback from the board, or is that letting you know that we, we want it to be as broad as possible? Yeah, we want it to be as broad as possible. Okay, thank you. So I'll just make sure it's in the materials that we all have it. Yeah. All right. Okay. So do you wanna um, do we wanna move back to the question on the public comments? Uh, uh, sorry, on the uh, public hearings, the nature of the public hearings, or do we wanna move forward and talk about the the other? Um, I would suggest we go through the whole process and okay. circle back to the yeah. question. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, um, like I mentioned, the, the first um, meeting is, is the meeting where we will approve the regulations to move forward into and start the formal process. The second meeting will allow for much more substance um, discussions. And then there's going to be additional meetings. And basically, after the closing of any public comment period where we have changes to the rules. Those changes will have to be approved before we move forward. So if in between, and maybe I want to look at Mr. Soule in case if I, I misstate that this, but my understanding is that after every public comment period, if there are changes, we will meet again as the board to discuss those changes and approve the changes so that it can move forward. Is that correct? Am I stating correctly? Other than anything that's not substantive, um, yeah, because it, because you're approving what is the substantive change to the text of the regulation. And so it would be a board decision to approve substantive changes to the text of the regulation. So we will vote in each one of those meetings, and we cannot anticipate how many there will be. There will be as many as times we have changes to the initial package, basically, right? And then the last meeting uh, here will be the final meeting once the package is ready to be presented for final approval so that it can um, be, uh, it can go to OAL. That package will include the final statement of reasons and that will be the vote with more consequence. That's the vote where we actually as a board approve the final versions of the rules to, to move forward. Do we um, have any questions? I just want to restate that we have four meetings here, but we don't know the actual number of meetings mm -hmm. because the third one could be, and it likely will be multiple times every time we, we have a change. Understood. Questions and comments? I just have my phone one clarifying question. So as I understand it, well, thank you very much for putting this together. It's really helpful. Um, I just want to make sure I'm understanding. So after this, the first meeting, the, what we would anticipate is we will then make a decision to have the, the, the proposed regulations published for the public to begin the comment period. Mm -hmm. So that's just after the, the, this first column here. Yeah. Great. And then thereafter, during the public comment periods, when we may be meeting during it or right, right after, you know, depending how right. um, we're feeling about that after the first meeting. Okay. That I think is, I think it makes a lot of sense to me. And I, as I you noted, like our final votes are going to be obviously mm -hmm. one thing of most consequence, and we still have a lot to consider during this period of the public comment. Um, I mean, are we talking about the types of meetings, whether this be board meetings or um, do we want to go back to that? Or staff meetings, or would you this prefer to, to table that topic until um, more comments? I don't mind. Why don't we stay with this? Stay with this. For just okay. A moment? Okay. Um, I can't, Mr. Lay. I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. I keep. I can't see you. So. <laughs> oh, okay. I know. I'm, I'm forward. It's not your fault. Yeah, yeah. It's just we're in a straight line, yeah. Yeah. and I don't want to miss yeah. anything that anyone yeah. has to say. Um, so the reason I was asking about the public hearings versus a board meeting to discuss is because I was trying to get straight in my mind the entire proposed process, including the public um, and everything to go with it. I really appreciate the thought that has gone into this, and I really appreciate the thought and I think the reality, uh, the sort of recognition of the reality um, that... Um, Board members will have, I think it'll be more than a, just a couple of days or a few days, but we'll need time to really digest um, the rule package. As you said, none of us have more than partial information mm -hmm. um, because Bagley King does not allow it. 
um, and we will have to digest it. Um, I also heard what you were saying about maybe not having a really in-depth conversation, you know, having been more familiar with the rules, we hear from staff, and then discuss whether to put it into the formal rulemaking, mm -hmm. which is just the beginning. And then, then we hear from the public. I'm a little puzzled about a board meeting to have a more in-depth discussion during the 45-day public comment period. Because if I think, as a, like a stakeholder, or as the advocate that I have been in the past, I'm not sure I would think I had all information in order to comment until I listen to the board discuss the material. And if we were to meet 20 days in, then I only have, you know, 25 days left if we were doing a 45 day um, public comment period in order to use all that information for my comments, if that makes sense. Um, maybe I'm being a very linear thinker here. But I would like to have as much information as possible, all the information if I could, from the public. Um, and thus, I would like to have the public have a chance to provide comments um, before discussing in more detail. And secondly, as someone who's been a stakeholder in the past and, and an advocate in the past, I wasn't sure how I would manage a situation where the board who will be making the decision has an in-depth discussion during the public comment period. Um, because I think that I might want to listen to that discussion before completing my written comments in order to have what I would see as full information. Um, and I would like to be sure that we don't create any kind of tension like that for the public. Um, so I just am unsure about that, but I really do understand and respect and I'm grateful for the rulemaking process subcommittee's attempt to give the board time to digest mm -hmm. and time to discuss in detail um, before the time for the final decision. But I would probably suggest, um, first of all, I would say I really do support their proposal for how we might conduct ourselves with the first meeting, um, which is to discuss, well, this is my amendment, would be to discuss any kind of major items that someone noticed, um, but not to have a hugely in-depth discussion um, before deciding to put the draft rules out for public comment. That would then give us the benefit of all the public comment, and um, maybe we could have a board meeting um, uh, after that in order to have a more detailed discussion, which we'll be having anyway, as we will be considering responses to the comments by staff. At the same time, I do understand the impetus behind the sort of 20-day or 45-day uh, meeting, um, but I just, uh, uh, I'm just unsure about that one component of it. Are there other comments? Or? I really appreciate the um, thoughtful considerations uh, from the chair. And I'm going to briefly say two things, and then I'm going to ask our general counsel to give more in-depth information mm -hmm. as to how we arrived to this recommendation. Um, the two things that I wanted to mention is in terms of the board having an opportunity to have a conversation, having the benefit of having um, access to all of the comments that are going to be received. The third meeting will enable that because that meeting is going to happen after the public comment ends and after the public hearings. My understanding is that the second meeting, there is flexibility in terms of whether we want to hold it during the 45 period or after. But let me ask our acting general counsel to give more feedback in I, terms of- I don't of know if I can, because that's not necessarily an APA question. That's that's your board procedural question. So there's not much more advice I could give you on that because it's not really an APA requirement. Let, let me add something here if I might, which is I want to restate what, what the chair said to make sure I understand. There's a what we have proposed is the initial meeting where we would, as a board, consider and, and mm -hmm. act upon the notice of uh, proposed rulemaking, thus initiating the 45-day public comment period. 
what we're proposing is during that that 45 days having a meeting because we will have just received when we approve the notice of proposed rulemaking we will have just received the rules pack the full rules package and so nobody on the board would have seen everything so give us some time to digest it and then have a subsequent meeting what i what i hear your thoughtful comment is stakeholders might want to know what we're thinking before mm -hmm. making their public comments and we want their public comments before um, really opining on what we think. The, the pro there's a little bit of a circle there mm -hmm. um, because everybody wants fuller information from the other party before they, they opine in that situation. Uh, there is some flexibility on whether or not we do that. What we're trying to balance is the our thoughtful deliberation, having an open and transparent process, but also the efficiency of the process so that we're, um, we have multiple opportunities as the board to review the rules and, and propose changes. We can, we can discuss them without really taking an action in that, in, in that intervening meeting. Nobody has to file their public comments prior to hearing from us. Um, does that, I don't know if that, any of that resolves it, your, your concern. Thank you. It absolutely um, helps. Uh, and I do, as I said, I really understand the impetus behind, mm -hmm. behind this, both to be sure that the board feels comfortable having digested all of the information and has a chance to have a full discussion um, with that in place. Um, I do like, I, I do, for my own part, I think I would like, the public comments, but I understand, you know, that we could go um, either way on that. My concern with having a board discussion in the midst of the 45-day public comment period, not after, if we had the same discussion after, I wouldn't have the same concern, is that in practical terms, it would reduce the amount of time the public has to comment because they would understandably want to wait for us to have a discussion before they finalize their comments. Mm -hmm. That was my, that was how I was having, I was just having a little bit of trouble putting those things together. Right. Um, if I were someone, I would probably want to listen to us talk, um, even though we aren't making any decisions. And I could be wrong about that. <laughs> um, I could be wrong about that, but um, that was my kind of concern about it. Yeah, and we, what we were trying to do was balance the open meeting requirements, and obviously we can't discuss among right. the five of us the contents of these these packages, except in in that kind in that kind of format. So that that was the, the mm -hmm. attempt at balance, but there are, as you know, trade offs there. Yeah, yeah. I, I have some thoughts. Mr. Lay? Yeah, um, it seems to me is is there a way to just extend that? Maybe instead of doing it twenty days in, we do it ten days in, and then we add ten days to the comment period. Um, you know, when the CPUC does it, right, they'll, they'll have, um, you know, a scoping memo and then they'll have some rules and then they'll have multiple comment periods. Um, and that way the commission could always just say like, well, we would love comments on, you know, they'll, they'll get a first take and then they're like, we would love comments on these particular subjects. So I do think, I do like the idea of having an early meeting to kind of maybe direct Kind of where some of our questions are so mm -hmm. that members of the public can mm -hmm. wait for us and, and and it's like well we have questions around how you would implement this or that it would be great to get comments on this and that all presupposes kind of can we add some time to this process for the public to process that and have more time to comment thank you mr mm -hmm. lay um and that speaks or i think supports mr thompson's observation that the public would like to hear, I'm sure, hear what we are thinking and we want to hear what the public is thinking. And I had not thought about the fact that, and I believe we were just told this, that it, our comment period doesn't have to be exactly 45. Right. It has to be at least 45 days. So we certainly could have a meeting and give people 45 days mm -hmm. after mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's correct, uh, barring any correction from, from Mr. Souble. We also will have multiple meetings and multiple sets of public comment to, to the point that Mr. Lay was, was making. 
we'll have the initial 45 days, we will receive public comment, presuming there are modifications to the rules mm -hmm. that flow from that process, we will then have an additional sure. set of public comment. Um, so there will be multiple public opportunities to opine, as well as multiple board opportunities. Right, I understand. Uh, on, uh, as proposed. I just wanted to take a moment to, I think, summarize where we are in the conversation, just to make sure that I accurately understand. It seems like there is general support for the idea of having this second meeting. The question is when mm -hmm. yeah. and how it interacts with the public. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that somewhere else. Yeah. And it Sorry. sounds like there's a consensus forming around do the second meeting earlier, say 10 days after the NOPER, the notice of proposed rulemaking, and then extend the public comp. That, that's what we were discussing, make, right? Make up for, right. Yeah. make sure there's 45. Make it 45 days after the 10. I, yeah. I, wa yeah. I want to make sure that we take in the input of the executive director. Yeah. We support the idea of uh, providing a broad delegation, including delegation on when to schedule. I am here, and I think the mm -hmm. comments are, that we are receiving are valuable, but I, I'm concerned that we might be missing other, other points that have to be also part of the equation. And maybe, you know, giving that flexibility to the executive director to make that determination as opposed to be very prescriptive in this meeting as to when exactly the, the, the board meeting has to take place could be could be an option. I certainly agree with yeah, that. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Thank you for that. And, and if I may, um, is it okay to? Yes, please. Um, so so I, do, I do want to be mindful of both the, um, effectively the ability to schedule a venue for the hearings that the public mm -hmm. has access to and then be mindful of the board's time and availability in those um, subsequent meetings. Both the, if we do one, you know, for the NOPA ten day, you know, ten days after the NOPA um, notice of proposed rulemaking um, is announced, um, we just want to make sure the board has availability then to meet in person under Bagley Keene. And then we also then want to, um, we will have to uh, be mindful that we have to decide. By the time the NOPA goes out, the um, planned dates for the hearings, dates and locations for those hearings as well. So when we put out the NOPA, we'll have already predetermined when those hearings will be and where. Mm -hmm. And so um, just want to be mindful of the moving parts. So I don't have a preference. I think both, both models are... Go ahead. Point of clarification. When you say public hearings, you're talking about the proposed meetings to take public comment, which could be board hearings or staff driven. Correct. Okay. Exactly right. And I think that the term in the APA is public hearings. Right. 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 Yeah. So Got the, it. So the notice of proposed action will say the date and the location. I'm sorry. The, the notice of the proposed action will give the date and the location of the public hearing. Okay. I'm going to propose something that might uh, kind of help us um, satisfy all of the <coughs> considerations and just see how the board feels about it. Maybe what we could do today is exactly what Mrs. Urban uh, just did is um, raise to the attention of the executive director the considerations that we want yeah. him to have in mind with his skills without really giving him a window that is so precise that then it might it might not be logistically something that we can that we can achieve so that you know we, we can help him understand the concerns and at the same time giving him the flexibility to best address all of them. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm going to ask folks not to nod. I realize we <laughs> nod a lot and it doesn't get captured by the audio. So if it sounds good to you, please say so. Yes, that sounds good to me. Yes, I, I agree. I think that's a really great approach. Yes, I also agree. So let me go back to our executive director and ask Mr. Uh, Sultani, did we did the discussion of the board clearly reflect the different viewpoints, or do you need clarity in order to let make me, that? Let me try to re reiterate and then make sure I captured it correctly. So, um, uh, with the exception of the decision of whether the hearings should be board meetings or uh, staff-driven events that are then uh, memorialized for the board, um, the preference of the board is to um, have some time or window by which they can effectively digest um, the full package of the rules and then essentially deliberate on the rules and that may be before or after the um, public comment or the hearing so uh, the public window public comment window closes with the 45 day 
uh, after the NOPA, or let's say for the sake of uh, argument, we do the hearing very close after that 45 day. Um, the board could meet before or after, but the preference seems to be to meet to try to meet before um, the uh, that 45 day, just to give an additional opportunity to deliberate. Do I have that correctly? I would add one other thing that I heard, which was that the public have as close to 45 days after that second meeting mm -hmm. to that the public comment period be as close to 45 days after. So if 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 the meeting was 10 days after the notice of proposed rulemaking, mm -hmm. then it would be a 55-day period or as close to that as possible. That's what I was hearing yeah. was the yes. desired. Yes. Uh, yes. Thank yeah. you, Mr. Compton. Understood. Yeah. So, we, so uh, the goal of making sure the public has a full 45 days to provide comment, as well as sometime before the public comment window closes, the board would like to deliberate and discuss uh, the rules. Um, so effectively, we're... Um, in essence, while we might start our public, you know, a rulemaking window, uh, official rulemaking process window, on the uh, NOPA date of the NOPA, we effectively are going to um, put time in after that process has started um, to essentially allow the board to deliberate on the rules. I I, I just want to make a comment that um, I wouldn't tie the executive director to say 45 days. Right. Let's just say something that is reasonable to Understood. provide the comments. We know the comments are typically received towards the end of the period. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's other considerations. There's a need to finalize the rules um, so that we can give clarity to the public. So let's not say, you know, 45 days, but just as, close as much as yeah. possible, a yeah. reasonable time for, for the public to comment. Will that be okay with the board? Yeah. 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 yeah, and I'll just flag uh, two other things. But um, while that's, uh, I just want to echo one thing um, uh, Board Member Thompson mentioned, which is that there will, uh, my expectation is there will be multiple opportunities post the 45 day uh, yeah. period. Uh, you know, my expectation is uh, at least one 15 day, if, but it will depend on um, effectively the f comments we receive. Um, so there, there will be ample time. Any additional time we add up front is effectively pushing back the calendar fully. And then I'll just flag that um, it will, you know, I'm happy to take this under advisement with the consideration that the board make themselves available at those times, which we, I don't think yet have um, the ability to have quorum during the windows as I'm anticipating one potential timeline. So, so as it stands now, um, under one proposed timeline that depending on what the board's decisions are, um, I don't think we have an opportunity to meet um, in that first, you know, ten days or so. We don't have the majority of the board available. So Is, just flagging that. Would it? Could we still meet though? Wait, assuming, you know, we don't have a full quorum. Um, that, I mean, I don't know if the rest of the board's okay with that. I'm just curious. Yeah, that's a that's a great question for the yeah. board. Is whether they want that you all want to meet, or whether uh, you know, or not. I, I would worry that. You know, it would be a lopsided conversation for the public if the full board, yeah. uh, particularly since it's the first time discussing yeah. the packages. And to uh, Mr. Thompson's point, there's some symmetries already with right. um, who's, you know, who's been able to, sure. to participate. I think that's a, that's a very important point because we're thinking about the ability to allow time for the public to come. And we know there's those 45 days. There's going to be a public hearings after that. Mm -hmm. And then other periods where um, the public can come and let's um, imagine that there could be a situation where the logistics just make it very difficult for the executive director to bring us together or to bring the whole board together. I think for that second meeting, it will be another consideration to try to have the five of us have that conversation as opposed to a situation where, for whatever reason, one member cannot participate. Um, that's something that should also be a consideration to them, to the extent possible, bring the five of us together. Yeah. I really appreciate all of this, and I'd like to hark back to Ms. De La Torre's observation that the detail, um, if we're comfortable, we can leave to the staff. Mm -hmm. um, but Mr. Lay, I apologize. I think I started talking and then- Yeah, um, I just wanted to say, the, to me, I think the second meeting, the point is to, to kind of share where we have questions. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that for the CPUC in my work, it's like an email ruling saying we would love further comment on this. And that helps direct the public.
public onto where the decision makers have have issues. They're not sure where to go on a certain direction. So my thought on saying like maybe we don't need everyone is like I would if I couldn't make it, I would submit my questions. But um, but I, I actually would prefer just to give um, yeah Mr. Sultani and staff kind of the the leeway to do whatever they think is best. You know we have like our our ideal preference, but we have realities of time and scheduling. So if if that doesn't work out, we will have that 45 day, we will yeah. have at least 115 days. So, you know, we will make do regardless. But um, there's a balance to be struck. And I think we've given you a sense of where our priorities yeah. lie. Yeah. If, and if I may respond, I appreciate, I, I really appreciate that in my, and I, I also appreciate not only are there information asymmetries between board members, but also between the board and myself, since I have a better sense of folks' calendars and availability. Um, my sense is, uh, you know, if there were, um, you know, if I were to make the decision today, if I, and based on what I understand of, of the state of the package and where we are, as I said, the pack, the, the 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 bulk of the rulemaking text is um, complete on on staff's end, at least for the uh, for in draft form. And there are some externalities with regards to the fiscal analysis and some other elements that we don't have control over. But assuming that we are, you know, ready uh, based on the board's feedback. Um, to put out our comments and you know in, in a reasonable or sorry put out our um, draft rules in a reasonable amount of time, I don't currently see that window based on the initial timeline that I'm seeing for that um, f for these for these needs. So if if it were you know if the decision were made today and we're currently on the path that I anticipate we're on, I wouldn't be able to accommodate that 10 day only for the fact that I know certain board members or the majority of the board aren't available. So then we would have to consider a sub sub uh, portion of the board. Um, I will flag that, as I understand it, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but staff can provide individual board members um, kind of support and understanding the rules. And we will be providing the initial statement of reasons, which will provide the primary justification for why all the decisions are ma made or what the, the how the rules were, were crafted. So the board will have those materials and then my expectation is after the 45 day and we'll probably I would plan to hold the hearings the APA um, stakeholder hearings uh, shortly after that 45 day window I would plan at that point once I think that would be a particularly good point to plan to have multiple meetings because there's essentially two points at that of, of, of in, in infection there one is that immediately after the hearings depending on whether they're board meetings or or staff driven, there's um, we're still in the same state with our understanding of the rules, uh, and then sometime after the hearings and the public comment window is closed, we will then have assimilated all of the comments that come in as well as the comments in the hearing in a form that's more digestible, which is like here's the bulk of comments, and we have to do that as part of the rulemaking process anyway, and so essentially immediately after those hearings and the public comment period closes, I think that's also a good opportunity to have these discussions. And then I would also recommend shortly after, say, give us two weeks to process all the comments, present them, maybe that's aggressive, but you know, essentially digest the hearings and provide memos to the board of what the summarizations of those hearings are. That's another point of inflection. So I think if it were uh, up to me based on my current understanding of timeline, that's probably what I would propose. And then again, as I said, there's other externalities with regards to the economic analysis that might alter that timeline, at which point we would have a, 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 you know, a, a greater amount of flexibility in terms of when to schedule those hearings. Thank you, Mr. Thank you Sultani. So Ms. Territory? I was just going to summarize what I think is my understanding of this conversation, yeah. and then maybe we can move into that conversation about the nature of the uh, public hearings. And my understanding from this conversation is that we all support giving um, the executive direction, the executive direction, director, um, a delegation on a scheduling that will enable him to consider all of those things. He just gave us, you know, five minutes of a lot of details that maybe we don't completely um, granularly understand. Um, with the with the um, um, in understanding that the preference of the board will be for this second meeting to be scheduled so as to allow time after the meeting for um, those who want to comment to have mm -hmm. the ability to receive and hear our conversation and 
present their comments. That was one consideration mm -hmm. for the executive director. And then the other consideration that was mentioned that Mr. Lay brought um, forward is the idea that to the extent possible for that second meeting, it will be preferable for it to be scheduled so that the five of us can be part of the conversation. Is that a good summary of where we are? It yes. seems yeah. to me, yes. Okay. Yes, and I will just, uh, this is just a very small legalistic um, note, which is that we're not delegating. Um, the executive director has delegated already the authority to do day-to-day -day administrative things. We're giving him our sense but we are asking that staff be the ones to figure out how this will all be right. scheduled and implemented. Is that correct? I think Mr. Sublet might correct me, but there is specific delegation for rulemaking that is typically approved. Oh, in the, the first... That's the one that I'm referring to. Oh, that I we, apologize, Ms. Yeah, so that's, oh, yes, You're so completely right, but there is an, a need for a kind of yes. rulemaking, a specific delegation that includes this this yes, absolutely. Aspect. I apologize. I misunderstood what you were referring to. And we did have the sense of the board that everyone uh, did right. agree uh, that the delegation of authority for rulemaking be constructed so as the executive director is able to do all of the administrative work related to it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so if, if we are, does the executive director have, yeah. So let's move on to the determination on the public hearings. And I want to just to refresh the recollection of the board mentioned that there's two options. One option is to host those public hearings as board meetings. The second option is to host them as agency driven meetings. And there is one um, option that is kind of a, a mix um, that will enable um, some participation of the board while giving the logistic flexibility of an agency-driven uh, hearing. And that would be to host it as an agency-driven hearing, but with some form of participation of the board, similar to what we have for the stakeholder sessions that were held um, in the past. So on that point, um, what what is the feedback from the board? What, what would be the preference? I, I'm, I mean, I in balance you know given you know the pros and cons of each and i think given the difficulty you know in, in just ensuring that we can all be there if there's a board meeting i would favor at this time the agency driven uh, meetings as long as we can either be able to observe while they're um, happening or be able to then do a, a follow-up um, video of them because i think you know they're going to be critical to our decision making but I just, I'm worried that if we have them as board meetings, it could hold them up. And my understanding yeah. is that those two things will be possible, Mr. Suple, right? Like they, they, yeah. yeah. They, they would, if we did them as staff driven, we would run them primarily in the same way we did the stakeholder sessions mm -hmm. with the exception that we would have them in person. It would be more of a hybrid meeting and um, we would obviously have sorted out the technical issues by then. So yeah. uh, you can't see me smiling, but I'm smiling. Uh, <laughs> uh, so that, um, but yes, so, so we would, Hold them as we did the stakeholder sessions. If we, they were staff driven, if we held them as a board meeting, there'd be schedules as this. And then just to reiterate the point, if we held them as a um, as a board meeting, we would have to decide on those dates prior to essentially um, putting together our package for submission to OAL. So that decision would need to be made um, relatively soon. Thank you. Just as a point of clarification, and if if the hearings were Staff driven, we would need to know the location and the date, but we would need more information if it were a board meeting or is it the same? So, you said you'd have to schedule it as the board meeting and notice it as the board oh, okay. meeting sure. prior okay. to the. Yeah. As we normally do. Right. Okay, thank you. And as one last point, I mean, as we did the stakeholder meetings, I just thought they were very effective because they allowed folks to participate, the presenters, virtually if they would like, and we were able to see them during the, the presentations if they so chose. And so I thought that just worked very well. Thank you, that would be the intent. Thank you, Ms. Sierra. Mm -hmm. I was going to say I thought I didn't have an opinion on this, but Ms. Sierra has persuaded me that I, I also think that the staff-driven model, like the stakeholder sessions, 
would be preferable for the reason she just stated. Now we cannot see members of the public who are participating mm -hmm. by Zoom. And we can hear them, and that's good. But I did really like that format where we could watch and we could see people who wanted to speak if they chose. So I, I, that would be my preference at this moment. But I think, again, that staff will have more information about all of the underlying considerations and would support either. I, I support either. I think whatever is easier for staff, um, and it appears to be the age staff staff driven one. And I just want to uh, say that, you know, staff is ready to do the logistics for the board meeting if that's our preference, and, and they have demonstrated that in the past, and so it's not um, a preference of the staff to avoid any logistics. But I do very much agree with Mrs. Sierra in terms of. Mm -hmm the considerations and the advantages and disadvantages. And I also like that um, hybrid stakeholder session that we had where you have the opportunity to have one board member to provide a message to the public. And we, we still can receive all of that information. I just want to stay away from being super specific. So mm -hmm. if we can enable that That's ability perfect. to have the video, great. But if there's any logistics, we let the executive director kind of guide us through what can be feasible. Indeed, and, and, and I just want to echo what um, uh, board member Delatoria said is, we don't, that we, I don't necessarily have a preference. Mm -hmm. It's more that um, I will then need you all to be available for probably two days and tell me that availability um, quite soon and have some flexibility on the dates that work with our ability to reserve the state buildings that we can get, you know, auditoriums, those kind of things. So it just adds to the, it adds logistical, Overhead, which I'm happy to take on, it would just also just require kind of substantive commitment from the board in terms of dates were available. I would expect we would do at least two dates, two days, um, and uh, uh, for for those meetings. Thank you. All right, Ms. De La Torre, Mr. Thompson, and Mr. Sultani, do you have enough information on what? Oh, we have like three so more far? points. No, that... I know. <laughs> <laughs> so are we ready I, to move? I on? think that we should check with the executive director. Do we have enough information on the public hearings and the format to move forward? Or is there I, any? I, I believe so. I have, I have good guidance, and I will, um, you know, we we will uh, based on the remaining discussions, I'll have more clarity on our timeline. And then that will essentially let me have some things fall into place with regards to when we begin publicizing our rules, when we begin or our draft rules, uh, when we begin, um, you know, essentially planning for the meetings, and then the subsequent points that uh, Mr. Um, Thompson is going to discuss. So I'm just going to summarize to make sure that we get it on the record. My understanding is that the preference of the board for the public hearings is to host it in a way that's agency driven, but flexible, potentially with the participation of a board member of some sort, and similar to what was done for the stakeholder sessions if possible. Is that a good summary of where we are as well? I think so, we're all nodding yes. for the recording. Okay. Perfect. Um, so that concludes my side of the presentation. If there are questions on this slide, um, we should discuss them now because Mr. Um, Thompson is going to present on the rest of the slides uh, if we don't have questions. No, I don't think so. We have questions. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go a little bit out of order and just in the in the interest of kind of continuity and time. So I'm going to skip ahead to the slide that is titled Formal Rulemaking Period, which I think is number four. Um, and a couple of things as we're moving through uh, what when we approve the notice of proposed rulemaking and enter the formal rulemaking process. Um, a reminder that all the public comments we, we receive, written and oral, have to be included in the rulemaking file. One of the things that we discussed is there is likely to be interest by stakeholders in uh, kind of clarifying, expanding upon their comments, and they may seek to meet with us. Uh, and so we, we talked to council about what that would look like. Uh, it is at the discretion of an individual board member if board members care to, to meet with stakeholders who want to clarify their comments, um, but wanted to also share the guidance and, and um, Mr. Souble, please jump in and correct me here if I misstate anything. Um, 
it, the the guidance as far as best practice would be that we if we choose to take meetings with the stakeholders um, regarding their public comments, that we not take them alone, um, that a member of the staff be present for the for the meeting, and we would be required to summarize the content of those meetings and then make them available as part of the public record. Um, as part of our, our obligation and commitment to a transparent and open process, we can't have meetings that are the contents of which are not available to the public. Um, so, wanted to share that. I'll, I'll pause there, Mr. Soublay, if I misstated anything there. No, I, I would just add, just notifying whoever that, that person or entity is that uh, the conversation with them will be part, will be summarized and will be included as part of the record. Right. And that is part of the Administrative Procedure Act requires. Well, yes, because the, the public is supposed to be able to participate in all of the all of the process and so anything that we have that is consideration of the rulemaking needs to be part of the the public file mm -hmm. so it's a public open process so we wouldn't want to see a challenge on the basis of someone had a meeting that wasn't recorded and, and put into the record so just just so that I am sure that I understand record the meeting record anything that could be interpreted as a comment and then that will need to be responded to along with the other comments it would, it would have to be treated exactly like that, yes. Okay, thank you. I just want to clarify the word record. I mean, it could be a written oh, summary. You don't have to. Yeah. No, yeah. I did not mean yeah. you needed yeah. to like yeah. record uh, the audio of the right. conversation. So it's just like an ex parte letter, right, essentially? Effectively, yeah. Okay. You're referring to the CPUC process? Yeah. Yeah. I, I was with you on that. <laughs> um, so wanted to, to share that because as we move into these processes, these things may arise and wanted to, to have um, a conversation, some guidance around that. Then the other thing, as we're talking about how we will deliberate upon the rules, so we will issue the notice of proposed rulemaking, we'll get comments, we will, the public will make recommendations of changes and we may well make recommendations of changes. So how we will dispose of those proposed, how we will propose them and then dispose of them is, I think, important for us to have a conversation around and discuss. There are basically two ways that, that we centered around. One is that members of the board may offer textual amendments um, where we are modifying, proposing modifying the, the draft regulations or conceptual guidance where we instruct the staff that we would like more of this and less of this, um, hopefully with a little more specificity than I just gave. Um, there are pros and cons to both approaches. The, the, a textual amendment has the advantage of being very clear. It, it's crystal clear what the word changes are, and then when it's disposed of, it's disposed of. The conceptual amendments you could more easily construct on the fly. We could have a discussion, and if we, we start to um, center around a concept, we could more easily give guidance to the staff that we would like this policy more significantly reflected in the regulations. The downside there is when they come back with the draft, it may not be what we intended, and then we'll, we'll start that cycle again. So we, as a part of this process, we also consulted with uh, Bob Stern, who was the initial general, the first general counsel at the Fair Political Practices Commission, um, upon which this, this body was based upon them. Uh, so wanted to get some guidance on how they did things and and his advice was do both um, don't close be flexible don't close off any any options which we generally concurred with um, my personal view is that i think a textual amendment is a cleaner process but certainly would not want to foreclose any other processes so in my opinion i think we should bias ourselves towards textual amendments where we can so that we can dispose of them and have them done with um, but wanted to surface that issue as well before before we start getting into <coughs> deliberating on rules changes and um, get your thoughts and, and see to the extent that we can put some process around how we're going to uh, consider rules, uh, modifications to the rules packages. The more clarity we have go going into it, I think the better our process will be as we're in it. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Did you want to take feedback now or do you still have more? Um, if folks have feedback, I know that was... Okay, Mr. Lay or Mr. Sierra? Uh, I, have, I have a question first. So within Bagley's team, like for us to be giving feedback like line edits or more conceptual, you know, or doing a little bit of both, 
Is the idea that each of us would be able to do that to send a staff? Or I just, I'm trying to um, visualize this in my head, like how this works in terms of deliberating as, as, as a body. In the way I'm conceiving of it, mm -hmm. if I had a textual amendment, I would draft it ahead of time, mm -hmm. um, probably with assistance from, from mm -hmm. Mr. Souble or, or somebody else on the staff yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that it was in the correct form and, and did what I intended. I wouldn't think that I that I would be writing a textual okay. amendment during a board meeting, but I wouldn't rule that out. Does but, that no? But this answer? is like ahead of time, right? This is before a board meeting. Mm -hmm. Right. Is it okay for? I guess I was trying to get the kind of ground rules that we can be then communicating each of us with staff about. I'm I'm thinking about some edits in this area, or I have some conceptual issues in this area. Kind of doing the prep work before the board meeting. So I just, that's what I think I'm yep. right, just trying to get. You mean get, from a APA or a Bagley Keene perspective? Yeah, from a Bagley Keene yeah, perspective. I would, I, from, from a Bagley Keene perspective, the safest course would be for each member to send potential drafts or, or changes to whichever staff is working on the member, whether it's the general counsel or the executive director. Okay. Um, back and forth between staff and each member is a little bit more risky because then the thoughts that a staff member is getting from one member may influence what the staffer is saying to the other member. And then you have okay. the risk of serial meetings. So the safest course of action would be one-way communication individually from a board member to a staffer. So, you know, if, if, uh, if one board member has certain amendments they want included, they just send, it, send an email to the staffer. And then at the meeting, all that's gonna be discussed amongst, at the notice meeting. So, I want to make sure that I understand. So just giving an example. So for the example of the edits that I had to suggest to the draft that was presented today, the process will be, and I didn't have clarity about this when I was editing, it was suggested to me that it would be helpful to bring edits. But So the process will be for me to draft those edits and then send them to Mr. Souple or whomever the executive director designates so that they have awareness prior to the meeting. Am I understanding that correctly? Right, and also um, right now under Bagley Keen, that information would be public as soon as you sent it to the staffer. So your edits, right, your suggested edits, if you send suggested edits to the staff member uh, for an upcoming meeting and okay. somebody, um, for example, someone submitted a CPRA request, a public records request, we would probably have to disclose that information. Well, so, and also, if it were to be the topic of the meeting, it would be in the meeting materials, correct? Right. Right. Which is fine. We're yeah. adding, we added it, we're adding it to the meeting materials today. Exactly. But in a scenario where someone was sending edits ahead of the meeting, then it would be in the materials for the meeting. And we can all refer to it in the public. Oh, okay. Refer to it. So then that's how we'll kind of see, okay, three of us had a similar edit. We'll see that as part of our package before board meeting for us to be able to discuss that. And then I guess I suppose staff would be prepared to say like there may be some ups, you know pros or cons to this particular edit as well. Okay. I, I have one more question. If the edits came from two members, I'm thinking about the subcommittee situation. Could those two members propose edits together, or is it best if we individually if we have edits propose them separately? I guess. Um, two members, like a subcommittee, could propose, or two members could propose, as long as they don't discuss it with or share group. it with a single other member. As long okay. as it's just th those two members um, sending it to staff to put it on an agenda, for okay. example, their, their proposals on the agenda. That's helpful because I didn't have clarity. I, I had a conversation yesterday with um, Mr. Lee about, uh, you know, his his edit and my edit, and I was thinking, well. I'm sure everybody else would love to see them before, but I just didn't send them around because I was unclear. So th that's, okay, thank you. Okay. And again, it's uh, just the rule of two. You know, the best rule the best is to, rule to never two. share it more than one other board member. Thank you. So, that yeah, no, thank you, that's very helpful. And I agree with this kind of doing both. Some issues I think are just gonna lend themselves to more of a conceptual point. You know, line edits are very helpful, but you know, sometimes that just maybe not right, depending on the issue. Right. So, when the, what the I was referring to was slightly different than I think what we heard, which is if you had a concept you wanted reflected, uh -huh. what I was describing was asking for assistance in drafting it, okay, so that you yeah. could then propose it. Yeah. There's another 
path that we could take, which is that the staff aggregate all of the proposed changes and present them individually um, as, I mean, it could be that it originated from, this originated from this public comment, this originated from board member Sierra, this originated from so-and-so, and just go through them in this order. Po this posting is um, yeah. in general. So, um, Try and think of how this would work logistically. So, if each board member sent their proposed changes to the staff member, each like let's say each board member sent their proposed changes to the staff member, and then the staff member would put it all together and propose a draft. Is that what you're proposing? And that draft that has no, that's not okay. I'm not saying so. Here's the proposed rules, mm -hmm. and then here are proposed changes on page two, line four, strike this, insert this, not a new set of rules with all the proposed changes already incorporated. Because the board is the entity ultimately accountable for the rules, right? right. So this, in my mind, the staff isn't changing the draft rules without the concurrence of the board. Right. Uh, that, that was kind of a going in assumption of mine. I don't know if that's a going yeah. in assumption of you all's. Yeah, I, I, I was, and but I was thinking that the staff may have some recommendations right. because it may be like you, this is going to impact this other issue, and then okay, I didn't realize that, or as a board, you know, may help guide this conversation. So yeah. it may be, I mean, may the board, the staff may need flexibility in how to kind of address this, depending on how many line edits, how many things are conflicting or not conflicting, and there may be a kind of a hybrid of everybody seemed to be um, concerned about this issue or had a similar edit. How about this? In, I think they may just need flexibility on how to address it. But ultimately, I agree, because we're going to be the decision makers of right. what the rules are. And you could do that in, in a couple of different ways. I mean, in yeah. my mind, you could have some that are non-controversial or, you know, appeared to be widely supported, that are thought to be widely supported. And these ones are for consent. Mm -hmm. And these ones are for more debate and deliberation. Um, this, this is the kind of discussion I think we need to know. We need to know how we're going to do this yeah. before yeah. we walk into it. Think, yeah, I think my thoughts are, um, in, in, yeah, in my experience, I think I, in my head, I was thinking, you know, we'd be like, I, I was more leaning conceptual to staff. I was like, hey, you know, these comments seem to make more sense. Um, and perhaps some line edits here and there, and then give it to staff. Staff aggregates all of the opinions of um, the board and then kind of makes their recommendations. Um, I just assume, just, because staff will have more time to work on this, mm -hmm. they'll, they'll, you know, versus us. Um, so, you know, I, I think with regard to the original question of conceptual versus line edits, that makes sense to me. With regard to how the process will work, I'm, I'm still pretty unclear on, on how we would do that. Because I was thinking I would just email staff saying, like, I like these comments. Um, and, yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lay. Um, I really appreciate you bringing the question to us. Um, I also appreciate you checking with um, experts at our sort of model agency. Um, it's a little hard for me to respond. We're all in the same boat, having not seen the whole package of rules. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but I think this combination of conceptual and line edits makes sense. Sometimes one will make sense. Sometimes another one will make sense. I also would like to echo what Mr. Lay is saying with regards to sort of the practicality of things. And my one, my, my only strong opinion is just that we have to comply with bag leaking. And so um, that I would suggest that we give staff that's hopefully the benefit of this conversation, I hope it's a benefit, um, and that they help us implement generally our consensus, which I think is um, a mix of conceptual and line edits, mm -hmm. is probably what's expected. Mr. Lay mentioned a, a preference towards conceptual, um, and it, I think it's going to depend. And then in terms of the information streams, that we take their direction. Because what we cannot ever do is cross the information streams between two board members and any other board member. And what I heard council saying, please correct me if I'm wrong, is that we could set things up so that we have a risk of staff accidentally connecting them because they're influenced by one board member and then they've heard from two more board members. Um, 
and that hasn't all been in a public discussion. So as long as it complies with Bagley Keen and the public has the seat at the table contemplated by the statute, I'm happy with kind of any mm -hmm. approach. Mm -hmm. Mr. Sultani? Yep, no, I appreciate, I just want to, um, I mean, I appreciate the board's flexibility on this and, uh, and kind of both models as well as, pro so I, I, I understand both a model question and a process question in there. Um, I will, you know, like to consult with staff, rulemaking staff, not uh, legal counsel here, to see what could work process-wise. Um, I'll flag. Um, I would, you know, be hesitant to make a, you know, not even a determination, but kind of come to a conclusion without everyone foreseeing the rulemaking package and the size and scope of the package, just to understand both the level of depth and the size of, um, and what might be involved. The other thing I'll just flag, which. Um, uh, board member Thompson's comments um, highlighted for me is that so we have the rulemaking text, the draft text that's going to be proposed. We have an eyesore that staff has put together. Then, um, and, the, and the board approves the rulemaking text. And then, but in the final package, the board approves the rulemaking, the final rulemaking text and the final, uh, fi the FSOR, the final statement of reasons. Mm -hmm. And the final statement of reasons essentially says, to comment number one, we responded this way. To comment number two, comment, you know, whatever, these these other sets of comments around this issue, this is how we responded. And those comments can come to from both the board, uh, you know, uh, the guidance of the board. We don't have to respond to them in the in the FSOR in that way, but we essentially comments, the board, the staff is responding both to comments um, from the board in a kind of a different process and comments from the public in this final statement of reasons um, process, essentially and effectively doing somewhat of the same thing. So we might look at that as another way, is if the board presents their comments in public and the staff say, um, this is, you know, to, if we take a process where the board are sending either at a conceptual level or line edits, um, the staff could then, and it depends on the process, that we can question, the staff could then say, to your uh, point, Mr. Thompson, um, you know, people on page one wanted to insert this and do that or some other people wanted to do this other thing, and staff responded to them in this way, right? We took Mr. Thompson's considerations and we moved this section, and the board could effectively have some response that way. I need to consult with staff if that's their preferred method, but we have a model for this, which is how we respond to public comments, and we might consider what are the advantages of doing that for um, the input the board provides. One thought about that is it is the agency as a whole that is responding right it's right. so public comment comes in says you should modify your rules to do this ultimately the and i just want to clarify this it's not it is ultimately the board modifying the proposed rules that so this comment comes in the staff says we agree with this comment the rules should be changed it requires a board action to modify, and ultimately the FSOR will reflect, so Indeed. the agency decided to change it uh, and adopted this change. I just wanted to make sure that we're, I'm not envisioning a process, and I don't know if you all are, where we go from draft to revised. There, there has to be intervening board action to go from draft to revised. Indeed. There, there isn't another path there. Indeed, and if I may respond, th that's exactly the, the, the point is okay. um, you, we, you, we could envision a process where um, the board members feel like they want to respond to individual comments or highlight individual comments you all want to respond to, or the board members can essentially evaluate staff's response to the individual comments and whether that's an adequate response, whether it's a lacking response, et cetera. So you could effectively go at each level uh, is what I'm saying. and. Um, you know, I think that's a consideration for the time and, and, and um, kind of time taking to respond to all the comments. But staff do, as part of APA rulemaking process, do need to effectively respond adequately to, the, to both what the board considers adequate as well as to what the Office of Administrative Law consider adequate to public to stakeholder comments. Uh, I just wanted to mention that we have had a lot of conversations with our, within our subcommittee as to which way we could do this mm -hmm. best. And the thing that I took away from the last conversation with the General Counsel of the uh, Fair Political Practices Act is um, be flexible, don't, don't foreclose any venue, and trust the process. 
just like we had a conversation about some edits that I had to propose, if we hear each other, listen to the concerns, understand where they come from, there is always space to compromise. There might be things like in this case, there was a, a, a preference on my side to have information so that I can avoid um, the appearance of impropriety. Maybe it was not approved at this time, but it, it's something that in the future, I will have more information about because we're going to have that memo from the DOJ. It's, it could be the same thing when we're thinking about the rules. Maybe, um, you know, uh, Mrs. Sierra might have a policy preference that cannot be implemented at this time in the rules, but we can all come to the agreement that in future rulemaking is something that can be considered. I think that the conversation will guide us and we should embrace that deliberative uh, process. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Um, Mr. Thompson, did you, do, you, do you feel, I mean, I, I feel as though I understand the basic issues. Um, and as I said, my strong opinion is simply that we comply with Bagley Keen. <laughs> um, and that's, that's not my opinion. Yes. Um, we must apply with, comply with Bagley Keen. Did anybody else have anything they wanted to add? Um, Mr. Thompson and Ms. De La Torre, um, should the approach be that, again, um, Mr. Sultani and Mr. Souble have listened to our discussion and they will um, put in to together a process to help us deliberate that works? Or I think that's, this, and okay. we can meet, I think, additionally as a subcommittee to, we, we wanted, we've been talking about this quite a bit. Mm -hmm. We wanted to bring you all into the conversation that we were having to get a sense of where the board collectively was. Uh, which I think we've achieved, and um, we can use that feedback, I think, to further refine the process going into our, our upcoming board meetings. Wonderful, thank you. I just wanted to um, do the same thing that we did before, which is kind of summarize it to make sure that everybody has clarity. So the general consensus is that we should embrace the flexibility of the idea that we might have policy points, we might have, um, in some cases, edits that come from individual board members that we will all, in case of doubt, check with um, Mr. Souffle or um, just our um, legal office to make sure that we are all in compliance with Bagley Keen if there are any doubts. And, and then finally, that in terms of um, the um, um, different opinions that we might see that we should be open to, you know, having different individual board members have different opinions, and also to the possibility that the agency might have a recommendation mm -hmm. that is different from the individual opinions. And that's a recommendation that will be put forward to us for consideration. We might you know, accept it. We might have questions. It might be modified based on our feedback. Just keep all of those um, options open. Is that a correct summary of the conversation? Yes. All right, I will say for the audio that there are nods all along the table. And I just want to check with Mr. Souble and Mr. Uh, Sultani. Do we have enough feedback based on that? Okay, thank you so much. Yes, they are so, also yes, nodding. Yes. Okay. All right, uh, Mr. Thompson. Uh, then we, one last point of discussion was around the role, the role of the subcommittee after rules are presented to the board. So as, as you well know, we formed subcommittees to uh, assist in the development of draft rules packages and, and provide guidance to the staff. So what happens to those, what is the role of those of those two subcommittees while we are uh, dealing with revisions to the rules? I think we, we started to um, illuminate that through the discussion we had around how the staff will process incoming comments and, and make proposed changes to the board. But um, the subcommittees have paid, played an important role in helping to formulate these rules packages. What the discussion we had in the pro rules or the, the process subcommittee is that once the rules packages are moving forward through the board process, they become a board product mm -hmm. um, as opposed to, to a subcommittee product. And then we, we then become an entity that is reflecting the the that was interesting. Um, we aren't moving enough. <laughs> the way the where the the staff would propose changes, either based on incoming from incoming comments from the public or incoming comments from 
uh, other board members that we would then collectively dispose of. A, a different path might be that comments come in and the subcommittee would play a role in considering should the change be made and work with the staff and present, we, we agree with these changes, we, we don't agree with these changes. Um, so th those were a couple of different paths. We tended more towards the, the, the former, which is that when the package uh, gets approved to be published as a notice of proposed rulemaking, that the role of the subcommittee in vetting changes would go away and it would be a collective decision um, by, by the entire board. Uh, but open to, open to both of those suggestions. Um, one observation is, and I've said this before, the subcommittees have an institutional knowledge, mm -hmm. but they also present an information asymmetry. Mm -hmm. If they have a role in processing changes, you continue that information asymmetry going into a meeting, the two members of the subcommittee would already have a view and knowledge of the proposed changes and what proposed changes are going to be recommended versus the other three members of the board. Would That information would be somewhat new to them. Um, as opposed to if we're all hearing it at the same time, we're all kind of on, on the same footing. That's, that's one point. The other is what are we gonna do with the subcommittees once the, this rules package goes final. Um, there are some issues that were in the jurisdiction or scope of the subcommittees that were not disposed of. Should those subcommittees continue to work on those discrete issues? Or should we reconstitute subcommittees, put those issues into a reconstituted subcommittee that may also address additional issues that we would, you know, there are issues that we to come that we will need to address. Should we keep the discrete subcommittees with their discrete scopes, add new subcommittees with new issues, or dissolve these, reconstitute them, and give them a new scope? Thank you. Those Thank are you the two, two questions to be resolved. I am feeling the strong need to stand up and draw Venn diagrams. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to quell the urge, but it is strong. Um, Mr. Lay or Ms. Sierra? I think, for the packages that are not included, I think that subcommittee should continue to work on that because of that institutional knowledge. Um, and with regard to the other question of like, do we dissolve, if, if they have done everything, do we dissolve it or we keep it? Um, I, I just, I think the pros and cons just kind of cancel each other out for me. So I'm, I'm kind of neutral on, on either direction of that. Thank you. Yeah, you know, this sort of gives a lot of food for thought. I'm not sure. You know, and I'm thinking of in terms of like staff, to what extent it's helpful to be able to brainstorm with some members of the board on, on some of the issues that have been discussed at great length. You know, I, I'm, I'm torn on that. Thank you, know? you. And I do, though, I do think, though, if we continue with our subcommittees, I still think, though, the ultimate decision will be individual and all collectively as a board. Legally, you know, it must be. Yeah, no, I know. But I mean, <laughs> right. I think that we could, you know, I don't think there's a, I guess, too much of a danger or that would undermine that. But I, yeah, I just, I, I, that's a, I, that I'd like to think about that a little bit. I'm not sure. Thank you, Ms. Sierra. Well, uh, it's going to be no surprise to anybody at this point that I am going to say badly keen. <laughs> um, so this is why I'm tempted to draw Venn diagrams. Um, because for me, a lot of this is about information sharing and uh, appropriate information filing until the yep. moment that we discuss and deliberate as a board um, in the public eye. And as to the first question, whether we put out the NOPA and then the subcommittees continue um, up to the end um, mm -hmm. when the rules are adopted, I share, I think, Mr. Lay's feeling that it would make, no, maybe it was Ms. Sears, I apologize, no, it has continue been those. a bit long, sure. um, that the subcommittees remain constituted both for their institutional information and also because that, for me, is a clear communication path that we can be sure doesn't um, violate Bagley Keene. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate and hear your comments about us having information asymmetries on the board, I guess I'm not wholly persuaded 
that having advisory subcommittees of two people who might be able to talk to each other is worse than each of us as an independent one of five people trying to figure things out individually um, will be more efficient. So I would, I would, I would lean towards keeping the subcommittees up until the end. And then afterwards, for me, it really turns on bag leaking. Um, uh, because anytime we add a third board member right. to a conversation mm -hmm. that two board members have had, we have to hold a public meeting. So for anything that, for example, a subcommittee discussed but didn't put into the package, we have two board members who've deliberated on that. And then I'm sure we have lots of things that nobody's deliberated on. And those could be assigned into any configuration of us as a subcommittee of two people. Um, where that leads me is I think we would have full information to figure out if we want to have advisory subcommittees after this rulemaking on a potential next rulemaking, kind of at that point when we know what's That's in right. the package and what isn't. So my feeling would be probably keep them for now um, to help sort of advise and um, if there's any, any need until the end, and then we decide what to do, probably dissolving the existing one. Um, but what we can do in new ones will depend on bag leaking. Right. One issue that arises there, if I'm understanding you, because I thought that was a good a good way to set to separate the issues. One is a future issue. Whether or not we have subcommittees after this rules package is finalized is something we can deal with in the future. Um, but wanted to surface it as something that folks should think about. And you're right that a Bagley Keen issue could could exist that might be most safely addressed by making it to other people. Right. Two, right. Well, it, you don't want to add a third to that conversation. Never add a third. Yeah. Right. On the how does the what are the roles of the subcommittees as we consider this rules package? And we can talk about this um, with with Mr. Sultani and Mr. Soublay, uh as as a subcommittee based on the feedback we get here. As comments come in. And I'm at this. I'm stating this as a statement, but it's meant as a question. As comments come in, as you're as as you were conceiving of that, would you think of the subcommittee as having a role in vetting the comments with the staff and vetting potential changes? Well, yeah. comments from the public. From the public. From the public. Right. public. Yeah. Versus, because we can't be aware of the comments of other board members. Right, that's right. That, it would be the, the pub yeah. comments from the public. Because we were in, we were thinking through different scenarios. So if you and I were a subcommittee mm -hmm. and a public comment came in and you and I had different conclusions, mm -hmm. then what would we do with that? Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to if the staff was processing them all and making recommendations to us collectively, then that problem doesn't exist. One solution is could be these five, this subcommittee agrees on and and those can be processed in one way these five or these four make it a different number the subcommittee doesn't agree on there's a recommendation from the staff that we go in this direction um, but there is not consensus among the subcommittee members and that would be a fine way to do it also yes and because subcommittees are solely advisory a subcommittee just couldn't um, we, we would have to come to the entire board right. um, in order for any decisions to be made. So in thinking through how a subcommittee may or may not be useful once we're in the, pub, the formal public comment period, um, I, I think it would probably be sort of as an institutional memory. Um, you know, as comments come in, um, being able to connect that to the work that the subcommittee had already done mm -hmm. and maybe we would be able, as a subcommittee, if I'm on the subcommittee, or Ms. De La Torre and Mr. Lay, um, to have a little bit more background that they could prepare and provide to the board. Um, now, that would look a little, I mean, that does look different for the conversation than the five separate people. Right. Um, um, so I don't, I don't guess I really have a strong opinion about that. I do feel like the subcommittees keep it clean for bad leaking. 
I like that. <laughs> you brought, you made nice. a run. <laughs> <laughs> I want to keep t-shirts. Yeah. <laughs> Take a moment to pause and, and try to summarize where we are. We, I think we're continuing the conversation. But what I think I'm hearing is that there is support for not dissolving the subcommittees, whether they stay more in a dormant state or whether they stay in the same activity state that they have been. That's something that we're still having a conversation about. But there is support for not dissolving the subcommittees until the end of the process so that they are available. I wanted to also take a little bit of feedback from Mr. Sultani and mm -hmm. the staff because my impression is that as comments are received, there might be decisions that can be made by the staff without the need to consult yeah. with subcommittees. There might be things that were, they already have enough information uh, from the subcommittee. So um, if, if we could have a little bit of the thoughts that Mr. Sultani might have in, in this conversation, that would be helpful. Thank you, and I'm happy to share my thoughts. I'll, I will flag that, again, rulemaking staff aren't here, so I'm gonna to try to summarize what I understand of their needs, but we would obviously want them to provide input as well. But my sense is it's valuable to have um, input from the subcommittees um, ongoing um, because of, pr primarily for the institutional knowledge, like. It, it's taken up, you know, some amount of time to know, uh, for example, staff have architected something in a particular way. And so um, the, the, the subcommittee members might know some of that history and then be able to provide input of, of whether that's the right um, approach. Ultimately, as, um, as, Shep, as uh, Board Member Thompson mentioned, we will ultimately still need to provide that, present, that, present that to the board of like, receive these comments, we decided to go left, um, subcommittee agreed we should go left, uh, someone else wants to go right, and what does the board want to do on those policy pieces? But again, I'll just flag, um, I wouldn't come to a determination on this until we've spoken with staff, as well as you all have seen the package just to know what level is useful, because to Ms. Delatoria's point, there's some things that we can just deal with, which is like terminology or something like, there's some, some comments that we receive that are going to be just like, oh yeah, that's that's an error, or that's something that's uh, you know that we should fix because it just needs to be fixed. It doesn't fit in the statute, or it conflicts with something else. And then there's some things that are going to be more on the side of a policy decision that the board will want to provide input on, which is the like, and everything's still going to go by the board. But the policy pieces are where I think both the subcommittee and the full board are going to want to really guide staff of like, we think we should draw the line here. What does the board think? Um, subcommittee might. You know, staff might want to draw, draw the line here, the subcommittee might want to draw it here, and then the board might want to provide input on somewhere in between. So that's my sense is this, to summarize, I think the notion is right to maintain the subcommittees, um, to let staff use them if they find it useful. I do think there are going to be issues that the staff will want to run across, not just the subcommittee, but the entire board. And I think there's other issues that I think staff are adept at dealing with, and we should let them deal with it. Uh, because ultimately the board will still see those in the rulemaking package and they're not, not, not that, be signi that significant and they will also be explicitly responded to in the comments. So not only will you see the changes, but you'll see, like we made a change on page 53, it says X, it should have said Y, we did so because Y. And the board has to approve not only the change, but that the, basically the response is adequate for both the board and uh, OAL. So, uh, sorry, yes, please, Mr. I, I just wanted to echo, um, working with the staff, um, there is immense value in, in the interaction with the subcommittees as they're drafting, and so I wouldn't want you to downplay the, the value of that interaction, and that's why I would see there is a value of continuing the subcommittees because of the resources they are to the staff that's doing the drafting. Thank you, Mr. Sible. I simply wanted to respond in a partial and small way to Mr. Sultani's comment by saying, well, um, by saying that I think that the subcommittees probably should continue through the rulemaking period, I did not want to imply that we would that subcommittees should in any way be like a hindrance. So I liked the way that Mr. Sultani described it and Mr. Sible described it as, as a resource if needed. I didn't intend to potentially add some other layer to the process. And again, like I feel most comfortable with it simply because I think it makes it very clear um, which board members have consulted on which topics and who is not with, you know, 
and, and uh, keep, anyway, excuse me, it makes it easy for us to understand all of those streams for, for bad waking. Further comments? So I just wanted to reiterate an idea that we shared before that is, um, you know, it's compliant with bag leaking, but I think we also have to think about being compliant with the spirit of bag leaking and think about what part of that subcommittee mm -hmm. conversation will be beneficial for all of us to hear because that conversation maybe doesn't need to happen at the subcommittee level. It will be more beneficial to have it at the board level. Um, so I'm going to try to summarize and see if, oh, sorry. I'm, I'm going to try to summarize and see if, if we all agree that in principle, the subcommittees will continue until the end of the process and they will act as advisories to the staff when the staff considers that there's a need for it, but the staff doesn't necessarily have to consult with the subcommittees on everything if they already have an understanding of the policy and the staff should consider whether that conversation that they might seek to have with the subcommittee is a conversation that the whole board will benefit from. And in those cases, yes, reserve those conversations for um, our board meeting as opposed to have them at the subcommittee level. Is this a good summary of the conversation, Mr. Thompson? I think it is uh, with the caveat that a, com a substantive conversation, I think that happens at the subcommittee level will probably need to be repeated at the board mm -hmm. level right. in right. order to yeah. get the issue resolved. Right. Right, so then at that point, the value of having that conversation at the subcommittee level might be little, right? Like it, it might be of, to the benefit yeah. of the public and to the benefit of the board. Perhaps. I think that it could be beneficial to the staff to, to the point that was made earlier about the institutional memory and the knowledge of the subcommittee members. I think that that conversation could be beneficial to the process, but it's not going to It'll be one step in, in the ultimate resolution of whatever that issue is. Yeah. Uh, for the recording, um, there are lots of there have been lots of heads nodding um, in response to Ms. Taylor Torrey's summary, and also to Mr. Thompson's um, sort of further observation and clarification. There is there's one point that I think we still haven't um, completely um, discussed with clarity, which is the possibility that one subcommittee might not. Um, provide in this initial package uh, all of the rules that are within the um, uh, commitment of that subcommittee. That's the second um, column here, the regarding rules not included in the initial package, is, is, is the general idea that if that were the case, that subcommittee might uh, be able to request from the board or just continue work on, on, on the aspects that might not be in the initial package, and that's a back leaking also consideration. Does that make sense as a general idea? Thank you. Um, Mr. Larry, Ms. Javier? Okay. I don't think I'm, I'm, I'm I think that, following. Hey, can I, okay. Tell me if I get this wrong. Okay. I think that the question is. Can I ask oh, the board sorry, members it, to bring their, their microphones? Oh, sorry. Oh, um, I think that the, the question is once this rulemaking package is put together uh -huh. and finished, there may be items that were under the jurisdiction of the two subcommittees mm -hmm. that were not put into the package. Right. And then the question is, should that subcommittee continue to work on these issues for a different package? Okay. Um, is that right? Yeah. Or yes. should there be another a new subcommittee? I, if you don't, I'm gonna skip to the end of that because I thought the consensus was, we don't need to answer that question yeah, now, right. we'll my, answer it later. My feeling was it would be hard to answer that yeah. question and that a lot of it would probably turn on Bagley King and who had what information, um, but that was my thought, so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay do we have enough feedback from okay. the yes. I think you also came up with the mar new marketing slogan. <laughs> <laughs> keep, keep, it it clean. Clean. keep it clean for Bagley. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, Ms. De La Torre and Mr. Thompson, is that your talk? All right, thank you very much for this thank you. really detailed, thoughtful, careful mapping out of the um, topics that we needed to consider to get us going on our rulemaking. So thank you thank very you. much. Um, our next agenda item is...
Oh, oh, I apologize. I am so sorry. <laughs> this will be the first time I ever started to move on without asking for public <laughs> comment. I really apologize. Um, uh, um, uh, first of all, um, is there any public comment um, from members of the public participating here in Oakland in person? All right, seeing none. Is there any public comment from those participating via Zoom? Yes, uh, we do have two uh, people waiting to comment. Uh, the first commenter is Andrea Cow. Um, Ms. Cow, one moment and I'll unmute you. Okay, Ms. Cow, you have three minutes. You are now able to speak. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, members of the board. My name is Andrea Cow, Public Policy Manager at the California Asian Pacific Chamber of Commerce. We are participating today to voice our concerns over the uncertainty of these privacy regulations and their potential unintended consequences. Throughout the agency's pre-rulemaking activities, we have not heard anything about the actual scope of regulations nor the costs that will need to be shouldered by small businesses. These regulations will not only impact large companies, but they will also affect small business owners who have relied on digital tools and platforms to connect with customers and build their reputation in the communities they serve. How are you reaching out to small businesses to ensure they are included in the rulemaking process? Many small business owners are wondering if these regulations will shut them down. What is the economic impact to businesses which is legally required? It is important that the agency is transparent about how many businesses will be created and how many businesses will be closed under the proposed regulations. We do know that the statutory deadline is rapidly approaching. We have not seen a plan for how the agency will address missing it. What is the agency's plan to address the July 1st deadline other than missing it. The agency should be clear about its process, timing, and analysis of impacts to small businesses. We are looking forward to providing input as the agency works toward the important goal of protecting California's privacy. And we hope the agency actively solicits feedback from small businesses on the draft regulations once they are available. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Ms. Cal, for your comment. Ms. Hurtado, is there anyone else? Uh, yes, there is one more person. One more. Okay, the next uh, commenter is Julian Canetti. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to provide public comment. My name is Julian Canetti, and I represent <clears throat> the California Hispanic Chambers of Commerce. Through our 120 chambers and business association uh, members, our organization gives a voice and represents the interests of over 815,000 Hispanic-owned businesses in California, many of which will be impacted by the forthcoming privacy regulations. Privacy regulations do not just impact large companies. They impact businesses of all sizes that rely on online platforms to serve customers. This is important because we do not believe enough is being done to meet those businesses where they are. We are standing by to provide meaningful input but the lack of draft regulations and uncertain, uncertainty uh, surrounding timing and scope of the regulations is a real challenge. In regards to the July 1st deadline or draft uh, regulations, um, we've, we request that the agency formally extend that July 1st deadline and extend the enforcement deadline as well. So, so small businesses have ample time to provide feedback and prepare for compliance. Some agency board members have previous, previously mentioned a desire to work with the legislature to extend the July 1st deadline. However, with only six weeks left, um, we are not aware of any such dealings or actions on this issue. After July 1st, the agency will be in violation of Proposition 24, the law creating the Privacy Protection Agency. How will the agency look uh, to uh, how will the agency look to extend the deadline? We do not see any way the agency will be able to collect sufficient feedback to draft regulations by the 1st of July, uh, when in fact no draft regulations have even been released. These regulations are too important to rush. We must be certain this is done right, starting with getting a full understanding of the potential economic impact these regulations will have on small and diverse owned businesses. Many of our members are operating on razor thin margins 
after a tumultuous two years, any additional compliance costs and activities uh, they have to undertake could unfairly burden small business owners at a time when they can least afford it. Thank you for the opportunity to, to address you. Thank you very much, Mr. Canetti. Ms. Hurtado, are there further public comments on Zoom? Uh, no, he was the last commenter. Thank you. And again, I do apologize for accidentally starting to move on, and I thank both um, commenters for their comments um, today. We will now move to agenda item number six, um, an update from the update CCPA rules subcommittee, which is comprised of Angela Sierra and myself. And we will be talking about the anticipated rulemaking draft and providing a little bit of background on that. Um, we wanted to provide an update and some background on the upcoming draft rules that are within the advisory purview of our subcommittee. I'll say a little bit about background and method, and then Ms. Sierra will talk about the anticipated draft rules. We hope this will provide some helpful context for everyone when the draft rules are published. As a reminder, the CCPA Rules Update Subcommittee, which I'll refer to as the Update Subcommittee for short, has been tasked with advising on rules that update the existing rules promulgated by the Attorney General's Office in response to amendments to the CCPA by the CPRA. We had a board training in February um, during our February training, um, our February board meeting, um, and uh, the training team from SOLID talked about rule concepts as a beginning process. And those were largely set out for us in the CCPA as amended by the CPRA and the regulations subcommittee um, uh, pre that was previously uh, doing work um, to advise the board further proposed these subject matter subcommittees and split of topics. So we sort of split the concepts in that way. Our subcommittee started with a list of topics identified by the regulations subcommittee. And then um, in our work, we identified a handful of additional topics that related most closely to the existing rules or topics we'd been assigned and requested that those be added to our work in the October 18th, 2021 and November 15th, 2021 meetings. At the November 15th, 2021 meeting, the board finished allocating topics, leaving any additional allocations to staff. I won't go over the entire list of topics allocated to the update rules subcommittee, although if you're interested, um, they are collected in materials for previous meetings. Um, but just as a reminder, um, these relate to any needed updates to regulations or things that um, are very connected to existing regulations, um, but were new in the CPRA. So for example, um, incorporating the right to correct, which is new, but very connected to the processes for existing rights and the right to limit use of sensitive information. Um, the list of other topics is pretty long, but it includes things like updating the definitions, making sure the processes that are in the regulations work with the new rights and that kind of thing. We thought it would also be helpful to describe our method of work. We've mentioned most of this before, but we thought it might be helpful to provide an overview at this point. In order to best advise the board, the subcommittee has endeavored to understand the implementing statute, the existing regulations, stakeholder needs, and other important background information. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry, I have a frog in my throat. Accordingly, we have reviewed the statute, the CPRA uh, amendments from the initiative, existing regulations, and all preliminary comments that were filed in the autumn. We attended the information sessions in late March and the stakeholder sessions in early May. All of those preliminary information gathering efforts proved to be very helpful background. With that foundation in place, the subcommittee has been working closely with staff as they prepare a set of draft rules. This means we've been meeting with staff at least every week to discuss topics and issues needed, excuse me, related to drafting and to receive legal advice. I say at least every week because we've met substantially more often recently as staff have put together a draft set of rules. Staff have presented all sections of the draft to us for discussion and feedback. And here I just want to say how grateful we are to both the CPPA staff and the DOJ staff who've been assisting us um, under the CPRA's um, uh, exhortation that DOJ provides staffing to the agency. 
they have given us legal advice, including on the regulations, um, as well as some of the other um, administrative work that you've seen the results of in these meetings. I'd also like to especially thank Lisa Kim and Stacy Schesser for their expertise um, that many of you in the public um, will have seen uh, as they provided expertise to all of us at the info session. It's been incredibly helpful to have the experienced guidance from DOJ as we think things through. And I'll hand things over to Ms. Sierra, who will say a bit about the anticipated draft rules. Okay. Thank you, Chair Urban. Um, so our subcommittee, um, our update rules subcommittee, we thought it would be helpful to um, provide a bit of information about what we expect the anticipated draft of the proposed rules to cover. Um, first, we expect it to amend the existing rules to accommodate new consumer rights and other relevant changes made by the CPRA. Now, as a reminder, we're, we are subcommittee, the update rules subcommittee, are advising on items that connect to what was in place prior to the CPRA. The separate subcommittee, the new rules subcommittee, is advising on entirely new things. So for example, the update rules um, subcommittee, we are anticipating the draft rules we are advising on to make, for example, necessary revisions, which may be very small textual changes, for example, to include the newly defined sharing of personal information, which is now in the CPRA, where it's needed in the regulations. Also, we are advising on incorporating the new right of correction and right to limit the use of sensitive personal information, which businesses will need to implement alongside the already existing rights. And we also anticipate that the draft rules will provide explanations on how the CPRA's requirement to avoid dark patterns applies to required processes. And we also thought it would be helpful to give everyone a preview of some other types of changes we anticipate as they may at first appear to be more extensive than they actually are in reality. First, we anticipate some reorganization in consolidation of existing requirements. This will help integrate new material easily and will help make the regulations easy to follow. Second, and relatedly, we anticipate some material that actually restates the statute where that makes sense to help the reader. The intent here is to gather relevant material into an organizational structure that is easier to follow for consumers and businesses and to provide some helpful context. And finally, neither we want to underscore that neither of these types of revisions are regulatory changes. They're just been provided or incorporated to help everyone understand and follow the, the proposed regulations. Um, before I turn it over to Chair Urban, if she has anything to add, I, I too um, so much want to um, thank the CPBA staff, um, our Executive Director, our um, General Counsel, Acting General Counsel, um, all the staff at um, California Department of Justice um, for the tremendous help on this. So thank you. And I'll turn it over to Chair Urban if you have anything to add. Thank you, Ms. Sierra. I do not. Um, do we have any board questions mm -hmm. or comments? Yes, Ms. Delatore. I just simply wanted to state that I'm really glad to hear that some of the effort has gone into reorganizing and consolidation mm -hmm. of the current mm -hmm. rules. And um, that I think it makes a lot of sense to reinstate the statute where it's needed to help the reader so that somebody who has access to the rules can read through them without having to constantly go back into the statute. Mm -hmm. It was a great effort that the Department of Justice did to enact the initial rules, but I think this is a very welcome modification okay. from my point of view that is gonna help um, the um, um, stakeholders that will have to interpret the rules. So I just want to, to applaud and, and express my support for that. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Other comments or questions from board members? All right, do we have any public um, comments from those attending uh, via Zoom? There are no commenters at this time. Thank you, Ms. Hurtado. 
Do we have any public comments from members of the public participating here in person? It doesn't look like it. Um, I'll give Zoom just a second more, just in case. All right, well, if there is no public comment, um, thank you, Ms. Sierra. Um, thanks to the board. And we will move to agenda item number seven, which is an update from the new CPRA rules subcommittee. Chair which, Urban. Yes. Can Mr. I request a five minute recess? Of course. My apologies, Mr. Thompson. I, it's all right. Um, we have been meeting for a while. Um, Ms. Hurtado, if we take a break, um, maybe we could break until how long would be good? Five Mr. minutes. Five minutes. Um, well, let's take at least 10, though. Um, let's re let's reconvene at 4:50 p.m. Can I withdraw my request? Then? Okay, do you don't want it that long? <laughs> I have a flight as well that I'm sure. Oh. Okay, all right, later. all right. Um, this is the chair's job is to try to manage uh, different interests. So let's say we will return at 4:43. That is that is seven minutes. Okay. Okay. Right. Thank you, everybody. All right, wonderful. Thank you, Ms. Hurtado. Um, and uh, welcome back, everyone. We will now resume um, the public session of the California Privacy Protection Agency's May 26, 2022 board meeting with agenda item number seven, new CPRA rules subcommittee update. The new CPRA rules subcommittee is Lydia De La Torre and Vincent Lay, and I will turn it over to them. Thank you, Chairman Irvin. Um, as you might recall, the new rules of committee was created on September 7th, 2021. Um, the scope of the mandate, as was mentioned in the prior um, agenda meeting, was to propose, help propose rules for those items that um, we had to rule on, but were not necessarily part of CCPA. The scope of the initial assignment of the subcommittee was to work towards issuing rules in regards to processing that presents a significant risk to consumers' privacy or security and the corresponding need to perform cybersecurity audits and or privacy risk assessment. This is Civil Code Section 1798. 185, A15, and then it's A and B. For um, this, to, to be um, precise, again, this is um, one requirement that does not exist under CCPA, but will exist um, once the rules are issued on this topic. Um, it was also assigned to our subcommittee to uh, present rules on the governing of consumers access and opt-out rights with respect to businesses' use of automated decision-making technology and the provision of meaningful information regarding the same. This is in California Civil Code Section 1798-185-A16, to again be precise. And again, automated decision technology opt-outs is not something that is part of the current version of the CCPA. In addition, it was assigned to the subcommittee to present rules regarding the agency's authority to audit businesses' compliance with the law, including the scope of such authority, the criteria to select businesses to audit, and the related safeguards the agency should follow to protect consumers' personal information. This is outlined in California Civil Code Section 1798-185-A18. In addition, during the November 15, 2021 meeting of the board, the scope of the mandate of the new rules subcommittee was expanded to include the following. First, considering if there was need to, def to further define the term law enforcement agency approved investigation. This is California Civil Code Section 1798-185-A17. 
Second, consider the need to issue rules on the administrative enforcement process set forth in CPRA, and this is permitted under California um, Civil Code Section 1798-185B. This will relate to the administrative enforcement process that the agency will undertake once it is um, in the position and under the legal obligation to ensure um, compliance with CPRA. Finally, issue, if needed, rules on record-keeping requirements that might relate to cybersecurity audits, risk assessments, and automated decision-making obligations. As highlighted during our October 18 update to this board, the subcommittee has been working um, continuously since the assignment. We have been meeting um, weekly. We have been also um, uh, uh, obtaining the benefit of the advice of the executive director, our um, general counsel, and other experts. Yeah, and I can take it from here. And uh, you know, as part of that, we want to thank all the agency staff, California Attorney General, and um, all, all the other folks have helped us out in our subcommittee work. Um, you know, as part of that, we've been reviewing comments from all of the stakeholders. We meet regularly uh, throughout the week. Uh, we review academic papers and other available information uh, re related to the topics within the scope of our subcommittee, which is quite broad. Um, and then we're consulting where appropriate with other agencies that have mandates that intersect our own. Um, and then as part of that work, we also, um, as part of our subcommittee work, we also help prepare the information on stakeholder sessions. Um, and we're making progress. You know, I think we've seen our agency make great strides since our initial meeting almost a year ago. Um, our ex executive director, Mr. Sultani, has been tirelessly working towards hiring required personnel that will help us uh, continue to do this work. And, um, but given the li limited resources and the scope of the task assigned, we've um, prioritized the work of our subcommittee to better serve the goals of the CPRA. Um, there are a set of rules that we prioritize that we felt were particularly urgent. Um, as you know, the CPRA provides that the agency shall commence enforcement activities uh, July 1st. Um, there's a subset of rules assigned to the subcommittee, as Lydia mentioned, that deal with this administrative enforcement process. So we felt that the issuance of those rules on, on how to do that administrative enforcement process was essential to put us in the best position to take on our statutory responsibility to implement and enforce um, the updated rules and the other provisions of the CCPA. Um, so therefore, our new rules subcommittee has concentrated resources on proposing procedural rules for enactment that ensure our agency can do enforcement in July. Um, and the, uh, with regards to the automated decision making, the privacy risk, uh, risk assessment and audit topics, we found they were, um, as you may imagine, pretty intertwined and particularly complex. So, um, you know, some of the issues that we are tackling as part of the subcommittee is how to define and scope that audit um, and the opt-out and risk assessment rules to protect privacy and other consumer rights while continuing to promote responsible innovation and listening to the concerns of small businesses as we've heard comments here today. Um, we're, we're particularly cognizant that small businesses may not have the same resources as larger tech companies, and um, as part of our subcommittee process, you know, we're looking into how to balance those concerns. Uh, we're looking at how to design our rules in ways that could promote harmonization with existing and emerging, emerging privacy frameworks. For example, the Department of Fair Employment and Housing just released some new rules. There was some DOJ, EEOC that we we're looking at um, as we develop our own rules. And finally, we're investigating what information is meaningful to consumers when it comes to automated decisions uh, and profiling, but across different contexts and types of decisions. So, um, you know, as a complex issue, you, you, we saw a wide range of comments received, particularly on these topics. And that really gave us, um, it really, get, uh, really attests to the need to carefully consider and weigh the requirements that should be included uh, on, on these topics. And um, as part of that, we found that because these three topics, automated decision-making, um, privacy uh, risk assessments, and the cybersecurity audits are closely related, 
we didn't want to issue rules as to one of them and not others. So given the above, um, we came to certain conclusions and I'll let Lydia discuss those. Thank you. So now we wanted to take this opportunity prior to the release of the draft rules to the public and the board to inform the board that first, our subcommittee has successfully been able to prepare and will be proposing several, several rules that relate to one, the agency's authority to audit businesses' compliance with the law. This includes the scope of such authority, the criteria to select businesses to audit, and the related safeguards that the agency should follow to ensure the protection of consumers' personal information in this context. This is, to be precise, California Civil Code section, the 1798-185-A18. Um, we will also be proposing several rules that relate to, um, oh, apologies, so with the assistance of the staff assigned to support our subcommittee, we made the determination that there is need to issue rules on the administrative enforcement process set forth in CPRA, and we will issue those, uh, no issue, but uh, propose those rules um, and this will, among other things, describe the process for the probable cause hearing that is embedded in the requirements um, of CPRA. This is Civil Code Section 1798-199-50 and California Civil Code 1798-199-55. With the assistance of the experts assigned to support our subcommittee, we have made the determination that there is no need at this time to issue rules to further define law enforcement agency approval investigation. Um, this is California Civil Code 1798-185-A17. And what is really important for us to highlight to the board is that the new rules subcommittee will not propose as part of the initial package, rules on the following topics. Cybersecurity audits, that's 1798-185-A15A. Privacy risk assessments, that's 1798-185-A15B. And automated decision making, that's 1798-185-A15. 16. Mr. Yeah, so you know, our, our request of the board is um, that you allow our subcommittee to remain active during the upcoming formal rulemaking process until we're in a position to propose rules on those topics that Lydia just mentioned. You know, as the commenter earlier mentioned, you know, these cannot be rushed considering how important they are to California businesses. And uh, by allowing the subcommittee to continue work on these topics, we'll be able to present, prepare and present rules on these topics as soon as feasible. And finally, as we continue to work on the rules on those uh, aforementioned topics, we would request that the board, uh, from the board that the rules we will be proposing in regard to the audit authority and administrative processes of the agency move forward as part of that initial package. And this will allow us to um, have enforcement rules um, to, to commence enforcement. Thanks. So we wanted to gather the feedback of the um, thank you the feedback of the board on those um, two last topics. One relates to a presentation that we already had, which is what should this subcommittee do in terms of the uh, three topics where we will not um, propose rules that can be incorporated in the initial package. Our um, suggestion, as Mr. Lee uh, mentioned, will be to allow the subcommittee to continue to work on those three topics. Uh, from a backlinking perspective, I think that will be preferable. And then there's some historical knowledge already in the subcommittee. Um, so let's pause there and just gather feedback from the board on that point. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre and Mr. Lay. Um, I was just hoping I could check my understanding. Can I just ask everyone to pull their yeah, mics? So I'm sorry. My apologies. I forget that it has, it seems to drift back away <laughs> from me. I don't know. I don't know how. Um, 
So I just wanted to check my understanding. So the anticipated draft rulemaking package for this package that we've talked about the process for today would include um, some uh, rules on administrative enforcement, how that would happen, on the agency's audit authority, and not on law enforcement um, investigation definition because the subcommittee has decided they advise that's not necessary, and also not on automated decision-making, cybersecurity audits, or risk assessments, which are interrelated and the subcommittee um, believes requires more work. So the thought would be that that would be a, a separate package in the future? Exactly. Okay, thank you. Well, I think the subcommittee should continue. That's my thinking. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, no, I agree. And this was a great example, kind of thinking about like why it may be helpful to continue forward because you've been, I'm sure, have a lot of foundational work. Mm -hmm. You know that that the um, subcommittee, the board, and the staff can really benefit from. Yes, and under Bagley King, you have the ability to keep working together, mm -hmm. and another board member cannot join. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I think that seems like the right approach. Are there any other questions? Uh, I'm trying to square this conversation with the conversation we had a couple of agenda items ago, which I came away with the impression we were going to wait to decide on on continuity. I I have a concern about what what will be in a, the next rules package. Um, there those three items won't be it, how are we going to constitute the, a sub, how will we all organize ourselves to work on those, mm -hmm. whatever the next rules package is? Um, so it'll have presumably those three items plus some others. Um, I'm reluctant to make that decision here today now. Thank you, Mr. Thompson, and I think you also should draw Venn diagrams um, <laughs> on the board. I realize I wasn't actually thinking about that second point when we finish the rulemaking package that we anticipate. I was simply thinking of the subcommittee continuing on um, and that we would have another conversation. But of course, if these items aren't complete, these three items aren't complete, it is entirely possible that they would end up in a package with some other item. Um, I do think if Mr. Lay and Ms. De La Torre are working actively on the subject matter, I would prefer for them to be able to continue doing that. Um, but maybe we should recognize that we will need to pause and revisit some point, whether that is the end of our process for this rulemaking package, um, if that makes sense, or if um, board members have an idea for another timeline that would make sense. I, I agree that may well be the outcome. Yeah. And so I think that just, once we get through this rulemaking process, we should collectively determine how we will organize ourselves for the next rulemaking package. It may well be that that's what makes the most sense mm -hmm. is to have the same two people continue to work on those three topics. Um, there is a logic to that. I'm just reluctant to make that decision. Sure. Are you comfortable now. with the subcommittee continuing its work for now? Yeah. Okay. Mr. De La Torre and Mr. Lay, have we have we responded with understanding, or have we yeah, have we I, gotten it wrong? I feel like Lydia. Yeah. Let me summarize to make yeah. sure that we we are understanding. So, um, the um, board feedback is that the rules that are ready should be incorporated in the package and move forward with this package. Is that a correct understanding? For the audit uh, and that would be the audit and the. Yes, well, I think of that as a staff decision. Yeah. Then we all look at the package to see if it goes into the NOPA. But right, right, yeah. right, with the understanding that, yeah. And then on the second piece, which is whether the subcommittee should continue to work, the decision will be to, for now, let's continue, wait until the final, um, uh, when we come to close to, the, to finalizing the current package, and then revisit the idea as to whether those three items should remain within this subcommittee or be um, assigned differently. Is that the correct um, so summarization? Thank you, Ms. Delatore. I think Mr. Sultani also had some input. Just a quick comment on that. It, it is entirely possible there'll be um, kind of concurrent but overlapping timelines on 
uh, for example, the, these other items by this pub subcommittee. So I just want to flag that there's not a, there might not be one end date. Uh, there might, there, you know, there might be some yeah. concurrence. Uh, so when we, for example, submit um, our initial package, our next package might be in process. Okay, so so we should look for the appropriate time to check in with the new CPRA rules subcommittee and the board and find out if the new CPRA rules subcommittee should continue its work at that time. But I would, I will say for myself, I would anticipate that if the new CPRA rules subcommittee um, is still working through our process with the uh, rulemaking package we anticipate, and they would like to come to the board and say, we think that there will be a package with these three items that that isn't foreclosed for mm -hmm. you to come to us with that right. um, information and, and advice. At the, um, but we will figure out um, when it makes sense for the subcommittee to keep working and when it makes sense to disband it. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much for that um, clarification. I think one thing that maybe we neglected to highlight is that um, the resources that we have have been really lending help and we have been making progress. It's just that given the limitations of resources and time, the subcommittee is not ready to propose it at this time. So, um, you know, the agency has been um, working towards it. Mm -hmm. um, let me summarize maybe again the understanding. Um, so we, um, as a subcommittee, should continue to work and at the same time keep the board updated on our progress on periodic basis and wait until we have more visibility on the timing and how we might wanna organize moving forward um, to make a final determination as to whether those three topics should stay within the subcommittee or, or be differently assigned. Is that a correct summary? And again, uh, Lydia, if you, um, the audio is not getting picked up on the stream, so just uh, if, you can, if everyone Repeat can pull. Or maybe, um, Mr. Lee, do you want to repeat your audio mic? Oh, oh, no, I was, I was just, um, were we talking about reassigning these three things? I thought we would just finish our sub, I mean, I think in my head, we would finish this, uh, these three items, and then just propose another package. If there's other items ready to be included in that package, potentially a concurrent one. Um, that, that, that's how I thought, like, we, our subcommittee would continue, hopefully finish, um, and then propose an, another package. Yes, that, that does make sense to me. I just wanted to be sure we were remembering Mr. Thompson's um, exhortation is probably too strong, that we check in and figure out when it's time for subcommittees to stay in place or disband, yeah. if I have a, yeah. okay. I think we are, we are kind of stuck because of Bagley Keene. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we couldn't, well, right. if we dissolve it, then no one could work on it. Well, the staff could work on staff. it, and okay. we would all individually be one board Sarah. member at a time, yes. Well, I think two new people could also work on it. No, I don't, well, we we could take advice, but um, I think that, well, anyway. Yeah, we, we had talked about that previously, but oh, okay. not to a conclusion. Okay, all right, um, Mr. Lay and Ms. De La Torre, um, what do you need from us? I believe we have enough advice to continue to work for now, and then let's make sure that we check with the board for any you know update or, or change to that um, mm -hmm. mandate that that was um, provided to our subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Yeah, um, right. Any further comments from Ms. Sierra or Mr. Thompson? Yeah, All right. Me. Do we have any public comments on this topic from any member of the public um, participating here in person? All right, seeing none, is there any public comment on this topic from anyone participating via Zoom? Not at this time. Thank you, Ms. Hurtado. Um, in that case, we will move to agenda item number eight, which is public comments on items not on the agenda. So this is the agenda item in which we invite public comment um, generally and including on items not on the agenda. Before we proceed with public comment, please note that the only action the board can take is to listen to comments and consider whether it will discuss the topic at a future meeting. No other action may be taken on the item at this meeting. 
I do um, want to reiterate, it, though it may seem that board members are not being responsive, we are listening. And following these guidelines is critical to ensure the rules of the Bagley Keen Open Meeting Act are followed and to avoid compromising either the commenter's goals or the board's mission. With that, I will ask if there's any public comment on items not on the agenda from those participating via Zoom. Give them a minute to respond. Okay. Oh, uh, we. Oh, oh. We almost had one. Please raise your hand if you wish to comment. There we go. Okay, we have a comment from April Chang. Ms. Chang, you are now unmuted. You may now speak, you have three minutes. Hi, thank you. Thank you for this very informative um, session today. I wanted to talk to the, um, the subcommittee issuing the new rules um, and uh, the board generally, just to, to reiterate, I know this has been raised before, but to reiter reiterate, given that um, it sounds like the, the most forthcoming rules, um, the soonest forthcoming rules are related to auditing businesses' compliance with, with rules. Um, just wanted to reiterate that um, the, there's an interest in, in having some kind of um, adequate time to be able to prepare um, for these new rules, um, given that, that there's, I understand, some um, shift in the schedule from the July 1st timeframe that um, you know, we're, businesses are, we're all still expecting that we will have to comply at this point um, at the beginning of 2023. So, so I would just like to, to emphasize that some kind of clarity regarding um, the expected time frame for when um, compliance is expected would be helpful and um, an understanding of the need for, for time to implement um, compliance efforts. Um, in advance of, of any auditing would be welcome. Thank you, Ms. Chang, for your comments. Are there further public comments from anyone on Zoom? Uh, there are no other hands raised at this time. All right, um, thanks very much. Is there a public comment from members of the public participating here in person? All right, seeing none, I will move to agenda item number nine, which is an item for discussion of future agenda items. In listening to the conversation today, um, I have um, that we will, when appropriate, um, revisit the subcommittee assignments, um, that we will have an initial meeting to discuss putting the, rule, the draft rules into the NOPA process and that staff will be advising on subsequent meetings, um, all on rulemaking, but we'll have plenty of meetings to discuss the substance of the rules. Um, uh, we uh, may have more discussion of hiring as that happens. Um, I would like to just, and this is far out, but just to put it on the table um, that, well, it's, excuse me, it's not far out. It's um, something that Mr. Lay and I believe Mr. Thompson mentioned from the very beginning, which is strategic planning. Um, obviously, we have plenty um, dictated in the statute as to what our purpose and strategy is um, for a little while, but I want to be sure that it's in everyone's mind that that is something that hopefully the executive director will help us facilitate at a future date. Um, and we will also be doing um, uh, some uh, review of the budget and, and so forth, as he mentioned earlier, when that is appropriate. Um, are there any uh, additional agenda items from members of the board? Is there any public comment on potential future agenda items from anyone participating here in person?
Seeing none, is there any public comment on future agenda items from those participating via Zoom? Not at this time. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, our final agenda item is number 10, adjournment. I would like to thank board members, staff, and the public for everything that went into this meeting today and everyone for their patience as we work out this hybrid meeting format. Um, I really appreciate it and I am uh, uh, looking forward um, to future meetings um, where hopefully we don't have as many tech issues, um, but in any case, um, I look forward to future meetings with all of you. And thank you all for your contributions to the meeting and the board's work. May I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? I so move. Thank you. May I have a second? I'll second. Thank you. Ms. De La Torre has, mo has moved to adjourn. Ms. Sierra has seconded. Ms. Hurtado, could you please conduct the roll call vote? Uh, yes. Uh, Ms. De La Torre? Aye. Uh, Mr. Lay? Not present. Uh, Ms. Sierra? Aye. Mr. Thompson? Ms. Urban? Aye. There are three ayes and two not present. Thank you. The motion has been approved by a vote of three to zero. This meeting of the California Privacy Protection Agency Board is now adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>